and Sarvashetra Cultural, Academic and Charitable Center. Good afternoon to my dear students also. We are on the second day of the program. We Ma'am, ma'am, you All are right, not, not audible. The schools program for you by Indian Institute Association with Sargashetra Center, which So let me begin from the afternoon to all the dignitaries. Good afternoon to all the dignitaries from Indian Institute of Space Science and Technology, as well as from Sargashetra Cultural, Academic and Charitable Center. Good afternoon. To all my dear students, welcome to the program which has been arranged specially as schools program by IISG in association with Sargashetra Cultural, Academic and Charitable Center, which is managed by CMI Fathers. This is a five days program. And today, August 4th, Tuesday, it is our second day. The program begins from 1.30 and it is still 5 o'clock. Today, we have three lectures which consist of one hour. The resource people for the day, we begin with Dr. Dayalan. He is the assistant professor of the Department of Aerospace. He is currently an assistant professor from Department of Aerospace Engineering, IIST. He obtained his doctoral and master degree from Indian Institute of Technology, Kanpur and subsequently joined IIST as visiting faculty. His research interests include aircraft design and fabrication and automated unmanned vehicle using conventional and neural methods. So today we begin with Dr. Dayalan's section and his topic is design basics unmanned system. We have two more programs followed by Dr. Dayalan's program. Before I hand over and welcome Dr. Dayalan, sir, a few instruction to my dear students. Students, many children would want it to enter this platform, but you were the lucky and privileged ones. So make use of this time. It's a blessed time, which only very few people would get. The moment you feel you cannot understand something here, try to understand it or try to leave the site. Because as today, some of the students were sending offensive messages because they were not able to understand what those great scientists are speaking here. So try to understand. It is such a precious moment given to you by the Lord. Only 500, if in case you are disturbing, you are actually not like 
distracting others also come in and you are disturbing so your mic your video as well as your chat is been muted or blocked for the time being but if you have any doubts to ask you can raise your hands and we will give you a chance to chat and ask your questions so from 1:30 to 2:30 we have our first session and with a short break we will move to the next session and till 5 pm our program continues and i bless you all i give all the best to my students before you eagerly wait and listen to our most reputed guest the first guest for the day dr dayalan sir you for your with great pleasure i invite dr dayalan sir to deliver his lecture thank you sir हेलो हेलो सर दयालन सर आई थिंक प्लीज अनम्यूट योर माइक getting ready i told you there are three lectures and the second lecture will be students you are supposed to switch off your videos that might help this network issue we need to cooperate with each other you should not miss this great opportunity uh, i think dayalan sir's uh, you know uh, mic is yeah. mute somebody has to unmute from there that's what he is sending a message i think you can see in the message the chat box yes sir me being a host i will do that हेलो हमें आगे बढ़ो द स्क्रीन इज नॉट इज बीइंग एबल Here, you sir. 
Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. I'm trying on to your spend. video. No, no. I, no, I have to share my screen for the presentation. Then I can. Share. Yes, you can share from there, sir. You can share from there. No, it is still saying host disabled. Sorry, please, please, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, both can be done. The laptop, then you can do it both. See, uh, you have to enable the screen sharing because the video is, uh, I, mean, I mean, I can't show anything in the video. Video will show only my face. Marina, Marina, please make him a co-host. Then uh, you can solve all the problems. Co host Sargashetra is the host. Sargashetra of no, co, co host. You please make him co host, then you know he can actually uh, uh, share. Please make sir. I'm just a co. I got yes they Alan sir welcome you sir is it visible now the, um... yes sir the screen share is visible uh, we are waiting for your video to come on the screen uh, I think I'm I mean I can actually explain it later for the questions I can okay sir as you wish okay so Good afternoon all. Uh, it is, it's, it's a big pleasure to be part of this uh, combined effort towards bringing better knowledge to students. And uh, I'd like to thank uh, all the parties involved in this. And uh, let me start. <coughs> let me start my uh, lecture. The topic is design aspects of unmanned systems. So the whole uh, uh, the whole structure of the lecture is going to be just an introduction towards what are the things that are important for an unmanned system and give you an idea about how to what are the important factors to design, design the unmanned systems. It actually involves more history because uh, instead of asking to uh, directly to bring out an unmanned system information, I would like to bring the history first and then explain it how it evolved and then it will go forward. So the first thing is going to be for what is what is the inspiration uh, regarding the flight? What is the main inspiration towards us to design an aircraft or any other flying system? The main is first is birds. Birds have two options here. One is the um, a bird which can actually cross continents without flapping much. It is one. And the other is the very smallest bird, tiny bird called hummingbird. And then it actually can hover, it can fly backwards with flapping. So these two are the, this, this is the, I mean, the albatross is one extreme and the hummingbird is the other extreme. In both, they actually use their wings to manipulate the force around it to stay in the air. So this is the main inspiration for the human beings to 
start designing towards the uh, unmanned systems or majority of the aircrafts now the forces that required for flight are actually uh, we can go one by one the first is the buoyant force which is already uh, well known in the school thing now first is the buoyant force it is actually when you immerse an object which is less denser than the surrounding uh, fluid obviously it is going to create a, a buoyancy force and then it actually can be used to uh, elevate system so if you are if the ship is the obvious choice the other is the balloons and aerostats so the earlier day starts we started we started understanding about the flight with this now the next is thrust force now this thrust force it actually is going to eject a big mass of propellants outside which is going to propel the body into a predefined trajectory or some some trajectory that we intend to use and then point it towards a particular goal so it actually is the one which is the second oldest and then then the next two are are the lift force and the force to rotation which are in the later uh, era of the science so the lift force you know, what it does is it actually interacts uh, it takes the fluid and then it the fluid interacts with the solid boundary and then gives some kind of a force which tries to keep the body in the air the other is when you have something like this an air screw which actually when you rotate it is going to again the interaction of air with the body with the rotating body it creates a force which will lift the particular body in the upward direction which is used in the propeller aircrafts like this also so now we have to look upon the force forces and then try to get through which force is better for us to manipulate and then achieve what we want the purpose of any aerial vehicle is to follow a mission even you have you have an rc controlled airplane you have a toy uh, toy quad rotors multi rotors and everything but at the end the purpose is it should actually take off from a particular position it goes to a certain point it has to finish something and then it has to come back to its original or, or it should actually uh, land on some other point. that is the whole idea about uh, aerial system that is manned or unmanned now we'll take each force first the buoyancy is really good because you have a less dense uh, uh, less dense fluid contained in some kind of a, a containment and then you use it to lift the body but the point is it doesn't have any kind of control over to push it to a new position it takes loads and loads of modifications and then the gas has to change there is a variety of problems that comes along with it now the rocket engines again it is very fast is very accurate but again it's not which makes you stay in the air it just travels in air to achieve a new destination on the ground or on some building that's all this out or in space doesn't bring anything to keep you float in the air or keep it in the air to to to, to make sure that you have more distance cover now if you take the lift force which is used in wings it can generate extremely good lift and it can be manipulated but again it is not able to hover when i say hover it means you have to stay at a particular point in air now out of these three forces only the buoyancy can do that the other two are not now you go to the propeller or the rotor blade which eventually used in helicopters multi rotors uh, or the quad rotor or the hexa rotor uh, uavs they actually can create enough thrust to go up and stay at a particular one but the uh, the biggest disadvantage of that is it is very energy expensive because if you want to lift yourself up the total amount of force required should be more than the weight of yours which means you need to create thrust of more than your weight at least 1.5 times more than your weight to make you climb above the and then to stay there you need to actually balance the weight at the same time it should not 
move any uh, anywhere else. So this brings too much of energy put inside. So now of the four forces, if you if you have followed the science, the simplest thing is science always go through majority of the time towards the better efficient the applications are better efficient energy efficient because that's the way we can reproduce that's the way we can actually enhance our design for the and so buoyancy is not used for large travel after the wings are achieved once the wings have been used efficiently and the combination of wings with the propeller blades you are able to actually manipulate a lot of things now we are talking about vertical take off and land which is now becoming more realistic in the us because you combine the wings you combine the propeller blades so you have a combination of four now let us go take only the those two forces and see how it is developed and then how it is helpful for our yeah, unmanned system so for both of these forces wings and propeller blades the interaction with the air is happening so even in buoyancy the interaction is happening in rocket engines the interaction is minimum i mean the interaction is not going to modify the main uh, I mean, it is like you firing a diwali rocket so in that the air is not actually doing much of work rather the rocket explosive part is the one which is doing more work that they acquire the buoyancy there is no interaction between live interaction between the air outside and the air inside but the wings and propeller work on interaction of air. now the interaction of air is the one which actually pushed the human i mean our our whole science and engineering towards a better travel so you would have felt this many of you would have actually traveled uh, the bus or train or car and near the window you would have put the palm of your in a form outside the window and then you would have felt the air interaction when it is actually on a high speed right so now if you have the form opposing the motion of the vehicle then you would have felt a strong push from the air that pushes your arm in the back side now if you were put the form facing down which means your form is facing down and then you are actually going along the uh, bus I mean, along the direction of the travel then you would have felt that the, there is actually a very slight upward push happen now why is that now the second example is the thin paper you drop it even if it is the air is not blowing you drop it it actually follows a certain path along which you can actually identify the air is actually moving now but it stays in the air more time why and controlling kite with a thin string so how will you do while you are flying the kite you just take it in a long distance you allow the wind to actually push it more and more and then once you feel the push is very large you leave it and then it just shoot up to a large in uh, uh, to a large height so once it goes there how will you control it you want to actually fly it more and more height what will you do you try to make sure that you are able to push the kite pull the kite towards you by that you are actually pushing the air and then once you release it because of the opposite reaction it actually pushes the kite further more now with different angles you can actually go farther or higher so this interaction is the one which actually caused the uh, evolution of wing mainly so from right from the start people have been thinking about it now uh, davinci i mean as i showed in the previous uh, uh, course the rotation you see this is actually a davinci's idea of an air screw now he has developed an idea about i mean following the same that we talked about in this interaction so he said that i mean he thought that if there is an interaction between a surface which is thin and then you are moving it along the air there there seems to be some sort of force whether it is going to help you or not is not known at that time but later uh, this start sir their tailing he actually developed a lots of ideas with the same i mean a lots of um, lots of uh, designs based on this idea so he started with in 1804 year with a kind of a kite here if you see this is actually the tail is actually a kite and here he has actually put a thin a cover along it and then try to fly it and then he enhanced it with various models and then eventually in 1852 he was able to achieve that with the flight but it is not recorded it is said that he was able to lift off the ground but just with the push itself 
now the whole idea is this is actually a thin uh, kind of a very thin blanket it doesn't have any kind of uh, stiffness to it so based on this he developed a, an idea for an air foil so where he was able to develop this and then he actually drew a diagram where he was able to say that there is a resultant force which will point up then he developed some kind of an idea here for an air foil right now while you are going the same way this idea of interaction with the air was tried out in live flight by otto lilienthal so he used to actually uh, attach this uh, entrapments containing like a bird uh, feather which is very 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 thick blanket of uh, material and then he used to jump off uh, towers and hills and then he was able to actually glide along and then he was able to safely land also he was able to manipulate the wing based on which he was he either enhanced the dive and increased the altitude or actually it was increased to the distance of land so now uh, this is the next step and then the very important step for in the interaction of air or the the best time for uh, me to you know, I mean reveal the name is the aerodynamics is this where sir george kelly was able to actually uh, bring out an experiment based on which he was able to prove that that there exists Uh, for a certain force due to the interaction of a body in the moving fluid or a moving body in the static fluid so static fluid means our atmosphere is in you are moving in a bike with your hand uh, outward stretched along the uh, velocity or the along the speed then what happens you are actually moving in a static field with a velocity right so now your hand is the body now it's the, your hand is going to experience a resultant force depending upon the position of your hand whether it is actually up or facing I mean opposing the motion of the aircraft or the vehicle or face facing down depending upon that is going to give a different type of force this is very important uh, finding which actually helps people to do so you can see here so now he is able to rotate this entrapment here which makes the body rotate and then due to the rotation you see it actually climbs up but initial position is downward are you able to see it follow it so this is the whole idea here so when you when he rotates which means that that particular body at the tip is going to face a straight line because you all know the basic mechanics of the rotation right so now this actually is the very important uh, finding which actually helps people to develop more and more in the aerodynamics so now based on this there is a pipeline glider people develop uh, langley's aerodrome assembly in us and then this is uh, horatio f phillips developed uh, various air foils for flying so their whole idea is this is this this material is this what about the phillips has developed this material is simply a thicker blanket it doesn't have anything else so once it is done then it culminated towards the right brothers fly So they started with variety of. They have a. They have had a biplane. Biplane means they have two wings attached, uh, tandem, in tandem. And then you can see that they actually went through a lot of uh, iteration. They were able to fly uh, at the end. And then you can see that they were able to fly with. Uh, this is actually a successful flight uh, video after they were able to achieve the first flight. So this is the uh, link. So now. why i am showing all these thing is mainly because what we have to understand in our unmanned aerial vehicles either you are going to have a multi rotor aircraft multi rotor uh, system or it is going to be a, a fixed wing which means that you have you are going to have an airfoil now look at this these both actually depend upon this fluid on solid boundary condition very simple so you have a fluid which is flowing and then you you actually bring that flow to a solid boundary which is actually a curved one you are going to experience something called coanda effect which actually curves you would have seen this when you are taking a bath or you are playing with the tap you have a very thin stream coming out of the tap then you bring it your your you bring your finger very close very close but not exactly touching the water once once you touch a little bit of water you will see the whole stream is actually bent not just the 
uh, 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 not just the distance of your finger inside the stream. The whole stream is now turned towards you. Why? Because of this interaction, the fluid interaction with the solid boundary. Now, the solid boundary is a curved one. Obviously, it is going to create a lift force or I mean, eventually it is going to create a resultant force. Now, if we use an airfoil, airfoil is what we what we said about culmination of almost one century of understanding the fluid interactions and uh, the ability to fly. Now, once this lift force is being generated, then we can actually manipulate it to anything. So now this is actually some a kind of an experiment in which explains for an airfoil how the flow actually happens. So this green is a flow of fluid at a very slow motion. Now you can see that here this curvature is happening. Why this curvature is happening? In all other areas where it is not actually touching, you notice this top area and the bottom area, the fluid is not touching the solid boundary, but still it is curved. Why? Because this boundary, that is the solid and the fluid uh, uh, junction, the fluid is actually attached to the surface because the fluid is having a viscosity. It is going to attach and then close to that surface, you cannot have the solid boundary is not moving. The fluid above the solid boundary is moving. You have tried that when you are in a boat or when you are actually rotating the water in your bucket. You have seen that close to your on the hand, nothing is moving, but just, just a very small distance from your hand, the whole fluid is moving in a different level. So this is a very important phenomenon, which actually is the is the main reason for developing the fixed wings and then eventually propeller. Now this phenomena is the one which we will be used. You can see that as you rotate this body, you can see how the the flow is actually manipulated. That you can see. Now this angle is called angle of attack, and then I'll explain with this photo. Now you see. This is called a cord line. Now, this is called the airfoil, which we already noticed. Now, this airfoil, the line joining the rear end of the airfoil with the front end of the airfoil is called the cord line. Now, again, this is a 2D diagram, two dimensional diagram. You are taking a cut section. So, now, as this velocity means, as the flow comes here, you can see. You can see here the flow direction is horizontal parallel with the line you can see here but the angle at which this line this, this velocity of the flow is meeting with this cord line is completely different because of which the curvature is happening this curvature leads to this modified force now this modified force is going to give you the resultant aerodynamic force right now that resultant aerodynamic force can be converted into lift and interaction. That is the whole idea. I mean, the, I don't want to go into further mathematics. The whole principle is the solid boundary and the solid object is going to be a curved one. Now due to the boundary is actually solid and it is rigid, it is not moving. So it is going to make the flow curve and due to the curve, the forces are changing. Why? You can see it from here. You can see this is a straight line, which means that you all know Bernoulli's principle. Now, in Bernoulli's principle, what it says along this, I mean, if you take a pipe of only this much from the top, uh, I think I hope everything is visible to you, uh, from this top until this fourth or fifth line, if you take only that pipe section, you can see there is no change in area. Obviously, there is no change in area. So, due to which there is no change in pressure or velocity. Now, if you come to this point, when you take a pipeline between this broader and this broader containing the airfoil, these two pipes, you take boundary as a one, two pipes as a boundary and take this containment, then what will happen is that here the area is getting changed because of which the flow is actually modified. It is not, it, it is no, more, no longer actually following the straight line. It has to go through a curved path due to which the velocity increases, the pressure decreases, then that actually is going to cause a change of pressure between this front part and the rear one and the top one and the bottom. 
Now, that is the whole idea here. That is the whole idea behind lift and drag. So, this is the one which we are going to follow further. Now, we noticed from this video that as you change the angle of attack, your curvature along the body changes because of which it is going to because of which it is going to change the resultant force. Now, that resultant force is being divided into decomposed as lift and drag. Lift is perpendicular to the V infinity or the speed or I mean direction of the flow and drag is parallel to it. Now, this lift is surprisingly as a function of angle of attack with straight line. This is actually a wind tunnel test done for a particular uh, airfoil. So, now you can see as you increase the angle of attack, you forget about this negative side, uh, we will talk about it later. The positive side, you can see the lift increases slowly and then it comes to a point after which it is not able to generate anything. Why it happens like that? I will explain this with this. You can see here, once the flow leaves the front most point, after that the flow is not attached to the boundary. The flow is not attached to the boundary, what will happen? It is not going to create any kind of pressure changes or velocity changes. If that is not the case, then obviously the forces are not going to be consistent. Right? So, this drop in force is called tau. So, you cannot achieve any more lift force after this angle. You can rotate further, but it will not create more. Now, the drag is also being given here. So, there exists a point at which the drag is minimum, and then once you, you go towards tau, the drag is also increased because, again, I would like to point out here that uh, you take this whole domain and then you just see that in the right hand side, the flow is, flow is very, very uniform. The forces are extremely following the Bernoulli's principle. In the left hand side, after the, after the flow is leaving the body, it is not anymore the Bernoulli's, Bernoulli's flow. You cannot actually have a proper relationship between pressure and velocity. So there is a drop in pressure because of which this forward pressure is going to be larger than the rearward pressure, which makes the drag. Right? Now, if you take this here and then if you do the same analysis for the top and bottom, you will see the pressure on the top is going to be lesser because of the velocity is larger because it is actually going, it has to go through a curved path. So, obviously, the pressure is smaller than the bottom one, which gives it. This is the whole physics about how the lift and drag has been created. Right. Now, we have seen the relationship, and uh, I'll just give you uh, some kind of a combination of fuselage and wing. Now, this is what the wing, a proper wing, looks like, and whatever we studied is this airfoil is actually a section cut. That's all. Right. Now, if you arrange a lot of sections together, it forms a wing. Okay? Right. Now, uh, there is a variety of wing shapes that you can make and uh, you can actually keep the wing location also. Now, uh, you can have a rectangular wing, you can have something called tapered. This is actually an elliptical wing. This is actually a swept wing and this is a large swept wing. This, this kind of swept wing you would have seen in, uh, in the fighter aircrafts, uh, cages or uh, any other uh, big fighters, F series and other French uh, all that. Now, if you take this, the last part, the before one, you would have seen this in majority of the uh, civil aircrafts in which you have this kind of uh, uh, slightly swept wing to enhance certain aerobic characteristics. With uh, sorry, I mean, I'm not going to bore you with of that. Now, these three are mainly used for small aircrafts, and these three are very efficient. Because this is actually has less material involved, and if you see close to the root, it is called the root because it is close to the fuselage. Now, this wing is very broader here, and as you go outward, outward it is actually very thin because of which you save a lot of material. At the same time, your masses are all concentrated on this center area, so which makes this area more lighter. Which makes you to do a barrel roll, which is called the complete roll. I mean, uh, maybe a bit of the uh, maneuvering uh, 
abilities of the two different involves right now this high wing mid wing and low wing again it depends upon what kind of mission you need now if you have a cargo aircraft this is a very good configuration because you can load and unload below the wing now if you have uh, if you want a, a continuous wing then you can go for a low wing and then this mid wing is mainly for the military aircraft okay now let us jump into the whole idea about uh, the nomenclature of the aircraft so this is the conventional aircraft we have a cockpit so this whole length is called fuselage these two are the wings this is the engine now this is called a winglet i'll explain why it is required in a short while we have something called a horizontal stabilizer horizontal stabilizer is mainly to make sure that your aircraft is in, in not having any kind of unwanted movements balance it now vertical stabilizer is the same now this is called elevator the elevator purpose of elevator is to change the aircraft nose up or down then there will be something called rudder in the vertical stabilizer it is to rotate the aircraft in the right side or the left side because okay i'll explain it in a more time and then you have aileron which will allow the aircraft to roll about the fuselage and roll roll means it can actually have a rotation about its center of gravity now why we need these three it mainly because to manipulate the aerodynamic force we already saw that wing is very good it actually can um, can actually uh, manipulate the forces how will you manipulate the forces let us go back to the position here now you see here towards the tip you see the uh, the, the flow is leaving here right but as you change the angle of attack what happens the way the flow is leaving the tip is continuously modified right now what if we cut down the tip and then rotate along rotate along the flow if we do that then that will actually modify the whole force so when you do the same in the wing it is going to change the lift here but when you do that here again the lift in the vertical and the aerodynamic stabilizer will change now the center of gravity is somewhere here so they create some moment which will put the aircraft down or up right or left depending upon what you so these are the controllers mainly okay now these are the main forces involved i have not covered the moment mainly because it really goes beyond your uh, your level of uh, education so we'll stop when we will we'll just stop the forces then we'll go to the uh, next okay now there are four forces lift drag thrust and weight now just now we finished our understanding about lift and drag yes there is in a very short while now i want to tell you something uh, for the uh, wing lift this actually is to ensure that there is no drag large number of drag mainly due to due to the okay right so now we have have now we have had a, a very basic understanding of of lift and drag now let us go to the point of understanding thrust now, thrust means there are many ways to uh, get a thrust we saw in the earlier stages that uh, we have rockets which actually is providing a forward thrust thrust means you go just push forward push forward that's it so now for us to have a thrust or before we go for us to have a lift and drag the aircraft should actually be pushed from the behind into the static gear we cannot have the uh, 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 wind always blowing in one direction in which which in which direction what we want it's not going to happen so we have to manipulate that out so to that we need a thrust now in the early days the thrust can be done by pushing pushing it or you just just run along the hill and then come downwards like what we uh, what a bird does it actually uh, if, you, if you remember seeing eagles and crows they don't stop uh, or albatross they don't actually start flying flapping if they are at the very high very high uh, altitude i mean if it is in a hill or in a big tree or if it is on a top of mountain what it does is it just simply jumps off the cliff 
and then you just mean to actually create the lift that's all but for us it is not possible we cannot actually take the aircraft every time to a big mountain or top of the big uh, building and then just push it down we cannot do that develop that we need trust and then to bring the trust we need to look for options so one of the earlier options and even now a very largest option for unmanned aerial vehicles is propeller right now the propeller is something similar to an airfoil or the aircraft wing if you notice the right hand side here we can see that the this actually this diagram is just the cut section from this center diagram see from the center towards the tip is what we have been given in the right hand side so as you can see there is actually an airfoil section at every in every cut you take any cut you take a airport propeller and you, you cut across you will see an airfoil air section now that airfoil section is continuously changing and continuously rotating that is a too much of aerodynamics involved but the whole idea here is we are again using the airfoil and the fluid solid fluid and solid boundary interaction to actually manipulate to create a creative so when you rotate this modified airfoil structure at a particular rpm that is you produce this torque and then you just give that torque to this it actually generates the torque so this is directly depends upon uh, the rotation and the type of airfoils and how it is rotated. these three are the main factors so this is actually called the airflow technology which uh, i see uh, uh, was able to imagine in a very early now uh, this is the uh, kind of a schematic for uh, the whole principle uh, now this top right hand side you see is called actually uh, the activity uh, screw in which he was able to create uh, an apparatus to bring water by rotating this so if you see this is actually screw that screw uh, instead of instead of actually having a grooves it has a continuous rotation of helical plate so when you rotate the water is going to be taken from here and then it is actually come along this and gets be brought front of this is the same principle as air screw now these are the schematics of uh, the propeller so in here you can see a piston engine is used to provide the torque to the propeller and this is how the tip and the other uh, other areas of the um, Uh, propeller uh, delivers the air. So what it does is this propeller, you can, as you can see, when you provide the rotation, it actually cuts through the air. So at individual sections, the airfoil is now being subjected to the flow of the air, but at different angles. As the angle changes, your lift changes. Now the lift is nothing but here. That is all the lift combined together. You can see that it is the thrust that pushes. because you are rotating in the previous examples the previous example here the velocity is coming this way it is perpendicular to the flow here right the lift is perpendicular to the flow flow here but here it is the same but we have now changed the angle at which the airfoil is now if you sit on the propeller and then watch it as you rotate you will see that the airfoil is actually seeing the velocity the incoming velocity at different angles and generating different lift as as you go along the uh, tip right now there is a inherent uh, problem with this the problem is that you sit at the center what will be the uh, velocity that you will be seeing the velocity at which it is moving in the forward velocity that is the only thing now as you move towards the tip from the center your r omega is going to be increasing which means that you are going to rotate at two different you are going to have two components of velocity one is due to the rotational rotation of the propeller the other is due to the incoming flow so these two decides that at the tip the velocity is going to be very large very large so towards the tip your thrust becomes very 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 different it is not it will not follow what we earlier thought so this is actually a disadvantage for uh, the current situation current propellers because of which it cannot if you even if you have infinite rpm it cannot produce a maximum it cannot produce an infinite thrust it has a limitation because the fluid boundary 
the fluid solid interactions at the tip causes a very complex organ due to which the propellers are not used for very high speed aircraft uh, you have noticed the jet engines or the aircrafts which are very high speed uh, military aircraft they don't have this kind of configuration very slow speed aircraft right now this is actually disadvantage which we will discuss now concerning these two because uh, uh, I, i have explained the propulsion mainly from the propeller point of view not the jet engine because we are not going to use it mainly now if we if you take we consolidate what we see in the terms of propellers the tip speed limits the maximum self generated is obvious now okay the gear mechanism if you see the engine is not going to directly give all the torque is going to actually do a lot of mechanism to deliver that we can change the speed so that again maximum rpm is limited you cannot have an infinite rpm so the transmission from the engine makes it very energy efficient you lose a lot of input energy however it is very useful in low speed aircrafts at low altitudes and it is very helpful for high maneuver aircrafts mainly because it has very low speed and it is easy to install on it it doesn't have any really complex things the box you get the man get from the manufacturer manufacturer you just attach and then you run at a particular rpm you don't have to worry about anything now let us go to the wings wings are extremely complicated to design the reason behind it because you need to know what is your mission how much weight you are going to fly so how much weight the lift I mean, the wings to lift everything is very important based on that you need to actually identify what type of air coil we are to use how much speed you have to fly and then how much big it should be what kind of shape it should be what is the shape of the air coil section we have to have and then what is the maximum angle of attack it can go so it has to be has too much of it. and then again we have too many shapes and tosses for air coil and wing so it depends i mean it actually makes us go extremely uh, very 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 tiresome to choose one and for careful it needs careful as some uh, fabrication as some reason is mainly because we're going to assemble a wing to take the right hand side uh, figure it you notice this size is changing if it is a rectangular wing it won't change but majority of the time you are going to do the rectangular wing right because of this you need to actually carefully fabricate all the sections and then you need to have a proper arrangement to hold everything so this actually make this makes the wing design a little bit complicated however in another bright spot it is well with me it has less drag compared to the other uh, things because obviously the airfoil is going to create more lift compared to the drag so obviously it is good and for long endurance missions when i say long endurance means you have you, let us say that you need to actually use the uav to fly for an extremely uh, large number of hours a uh, say 2 hours 3 hours it actually needs to spend energy in a very 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 delicate manner so for that we need an aircraft with less drag okay so that is possible if you have a proper wing design and secondly it is very stable and sturdy design the wing if it is properly designed it can give extreme stability so let us say you are having a survey if you are having a survey it actually brings you uh, i mean uh, an aerial survey or let us say that you go for Perception rescue mission, or you want to actually observe something for a very large time. You need lot, lots of energy to spend, and then, and you need actually a camera or some sort of surveillance instruments working on a very stable platform. It's very important. So wings actually provide that. Now, very easy in control. It is very easy in control because it is actually a linear system. It doesn't have any other problem. now let us go with this background let us go to the um, video of the uav model modules now uav is as a i mean as a definition it is an aerial vehicle without a pilot to control i mean without a pilot to control in the cockpit that is very important it will be remotely controlled but still it is called unmanned because it doesn't have a man sitting on the aircraft now It is smaller in size. It is very compact. 
is mostly controlled by the remote. And sometimes it will be automated, and yes, it will be automated. Uh, you uh, find every feature will be available. An autonomous UAV has a mission to execute with minimum room for error, and it has to actually go through a predefined waypoints and pre programmed control algorithms are required. Now, uh, a proper controller is need to be enabled, uh, designed to ensure that the UAV is able to maneuver efficiently for the mission. Now, there is a similarity. The similarity is between an aircraft and the UAV. For a wing-based UAVs, it is the design aspects are almost similar. The toys of airfoil, the methodology, the manufacturing, uh, the flight test, everything is similar. You don't have to uh, do a very big thing. Okay, so only the problem is the wing. For the wing, the size, shape, and dimensions changes as you change for the UAV. Uh, mission UAV, um, mission of the UAV. So let us take uh, various missions into account now. So you take an aerial surveillance uh, for a natural disaster or you want to monitor some natural thing. So in that case, your UAV has to be up in the air, very large altitude. And secondly, it has to be there roaming around at a particular position only, a particular point only for a very long duration. So it needs to be very large in wind because it can generate so much of lift. Right. Now you take something for, uh, let us say, you want to uh, uh, you want to just do a demonstration or you are going entering a UAV competition. So in that, there are certain maneuvers that are required. You need actually a large, big wing. You need a small rectangular wing which, with which you can actually rotate and quickly do all the maneuvers. So things change depending upon the mission. Now, if you go for the multi-rotor UAVs, the propeller engines can be designed smaller with electrical engines. So if you take a large big aircraft, it is usually like this. You have a big engine box, and then there's a gearbox. The engine runs mainly using fossil fuels, and then the mechanical system delivers the torque completely. Now, if you take an UAV, we cannot have that. It is actually going to increase the weight of the system because obviously the engine weight is very large. The moving parts are there, that if there is a moving, big moving part is involved, it is going to create a lot of disturbances first. So we need to have a very small engine with a very limited uh, performance if you go for that, or you can go for an electrical or the electric motor, brushless electric motor, which actually has better moving, I mean, uh, better, uh, better performance uh, in terms of power consumptions and the way the RPM is being delivered. So we have to use those. And again, the size of the motor depends on the payload used. Let us say you are using a quad rotor. Now, you want to actually uh, take a payload of at least seven, four, one, one kilo. Now, for you to actually just take off one kilo of uh, payload, including the weight of the aircraft, uh, the weight of the UAV, then what you need is four motors, each having at least 0.5 kg which amounts to 2K. That by that way, you can actually take it up quickly and then move forward quickly. If you have 1.5 kgs of uh, thrust coming from all the four, then obviously it is going to be very slow and more power consumption. So this arrangement has to be improved. However, the fixed wing have, the fixed wing UAVs have more efficient uh, ways of now, I want to give, just give you a little bit of uh, exposure towards what we did. And from this, I can actually give you uh, uh, what I meant in the previous one. Now, with the fixed wing, you can see uh, it just has one fuselage, a big wing, a rectangular wing, and a horizontal stabilizer and a vertical stabilizer. Now, this is called aileron, uh, elevator, and rudder. Now, you have two motors attached here. Now, with these motors, I can actually um, um, I can actually take off at a very low speed and then I can actually fly and get, I, mean, I can actually lift off my aircraft in a better way. Now you go to the multi rotor system, you have four motors, now you have a flight controller, a battery attached, and then it is actually going to uh, lift off the whole. Now you have that this is, <coughs> this is an octocopter. Now, now the same can be applied for the flapping wing UAV also, but it is very important that the mechanical parts are minimal. Now, the latest uh, 
development in the recent time for a, for a UAV is the VTOL UAV because mainly because the, as I mentioned, you need some sort of uh, high speed compared to this multi-rotor to take off because the lift needs to be developed. For us to get the lift, the air around the uh, wing should move to certain velocity. So until that, it won't actually lift up. So this is a disadvantage for the fixed. But once it actually picks up, then it can stay in the air for longer time. It is more energy. So to combine this with the multi-rotor UAV positive positive, what are those? You have the four motors which can actually take off from zero speed, from zero meter per second. It can actually rise and then immediately it can move forward without any kind of aerodynamic bond. So when we combine these two, it actually gives us an, a, a, a UAV which can take it, take off and land at any desired position and still achieve what the fixed wing will do. So this will help us uh, couple two individual things together to achieve a better performance. So this VTOL UAV can take off and land at any point, and yet it can actually have the same better long, better, better, better energy efficient methods to stay in the because of the fixed Now the important, very important thing for a UAV is a flight controller. Why do we need a flight controller? The point is being that we are actually going for an automated system. Because the next step towards uh, the development is an auto fully automated UAV. For that, you need some kind of electronic system which can command your UAV in a particular direction. So how we are going to command it? As I mentioned, you have four motors or two motors or eight motors. That motors has to be, if you, if you rotate one particular motor lesser than the other, obviously it is going to create a movement and then you are going to change. So you are manipulating. So to manipulate the system in the way what we want, so we need a system of, or the electronic system which actually has the component such that it can mo modify the performance on board and then it can also take automated commands from people. So it is the heart of an autonomous universe uh, UAV can take remote control and act as a full autopilot. Both should be there because in some situation you need a, a, a pilot to maneuver. It should be, uh, the processor should be very quick and it should be very I mean, very quick for commanding and design. It should have a designing I mean, decision making sense also because once it goes automated, then it should make a decision. Even though the decisions are very, very, very limited, but still, it should be fast enough to do that. It should be interfaced with, uh, I mean, you cannot have a very large controller for a very small unit. So you need to go smaller and smaller. And it should be very versatile so that you can actually manipulate. You can use that as a manipulator for a fixed wing and a material. And mass and size should be minimum, minimum, and then it should have enough processing capability also, right? So all in all, if I combine everything, and then I give you a kind of a flowchart here. So uh, if we, I mean, if we, if we take a UAV design, it starts with the mission statement. Either you want to float at a particular altitude, hover around, or you want to rotate, or you want to actually um, uh, just loiter around a particular point for surveillance, or you want to do some measurement, or let us say you just want to have fun, or you are going to monitor some uh, of the meetings or some position. Everything comes into picture. So the mission statement is the one which translates directly into the type of UV we're going to get. So you take, you, I mean, if you want to let us say that be at one particular point in air, then you don't need a fixed wing. You need a multi-rotor system in which you can stay at longer, at longer time. So the first statement is translate the mission statements to aerodynamics and flight control. So once your mission statement is being given, mission means what is the purpose of your UAV? It really means then you can directly go into a fixed wing or a multi-rotor immediately. And once you enter that, then the aerodynamics and flight control of that particular system is being decided on. Once you enter, then you go to the shape and size of the wing. And in case of motor or multi rotors, you decide what are the number of multi rotors you have. And then you have to check, check about what the thrust required and then what the type of control required in paper, not in, in the book. Right? 
The next is once the shape is ready, then you go for the manufacturing. You have to assemble it. You have to use the aerodynamic data to fabricate, and then uh, you have to do that. In the parallel, you have, you have to start procuring the power systems, and then you have to start testing it in the home or in the ground. Parallelly, you have to do the mathematical principle of how the control works, how the dynamics works. That is actually a higher level, but still, I want to give you a full uh, view of it. Right. So, if the validation fails in between, then you should you should be able to go back to the mission statement, modify anything, and then come back again in the loop. So, once these two are carried out, now you go to the flight controller. So, you design the control system. You already designed you designed the control system. You have to implement it. You have to test it in the ground. You have to test it in the flight. You have to test it under various conditions. Once everything is ready, your UAV is ready for implementation. Or if it is not uh, coming within the mission statement or within your understanding of what it should achieve, it is better you go back again. You modify the mission statement, or you go back and modify the details. So this actually ensures the complete design part. So. This actually is this is actually a, a holistic uh, approach for an autonomous UAV. So understand the mission statement. You have to make sure that path planning, path planning is defined, and then the aircraft design, aircraft design or multiple design, depending upon what is required. So in that, you need to put put forward before you start manufacturing. You should actually put forward every ideas, so to do all the calculations, ensure that. The one which you are fabricating is not actually a bad design by any means, right? You have to combine the propeller, wings. You have to explore most of the options on paper before you actually start fabricating. It is very important. Now, in the manufacturing, you just you have to go because you, the, the purpose of UAV is one way or another is cost effective. The reason why many of the time you actually go for UAV is to reduce the pilot. Uh, uh, the, the loss of any kind of human life, that's the first thing for any other situations. And second is for a very small cost, you want to achieve majority of the missions that the aircraft is doing, not transport, please. Just other than transport. So you have to look for cost effective methods. The best way to actually achieve multiple fabrications, uh, multiple fabrication, I mean, multiple, I mean, fabrication of multiple units, and then uh, it should minimize the maintenance also. You should manufacture something which actually reduces the maintenance cost. Now, again, for power systems, it is actually a completely a, a, a very new um, and very important uh, discipline for the UAV design. It needs a pro proper team to sit down, calculate all the power, how much it is required, and what kind of batteries you are going to use, how you are going to distribute the power, and how efficiently you can actually utilize the modern technology. You take solar, you take wind energy, how you are able to achieve them. That also has to be included. Now you go to the avionics, it involves the flight controller, you need proper measurement, and then it should have a proper identification for the ground control, control group. Because without that, it is very difficult to transmit the data. And then the finally, the artificial intelligence. Yes. The next step is to have a completely intelligent uh, and autonomous uh, online systems, which we are trying to drive. Right? So, with this, I uh, end, your, end my lecture and I'm ready for the questions. So, it has put a uh, start. Queries. Maybe we can start an answer. So I think I shall I'll uh, start answering from the. It was wonderful. From you start now. Uh, Propellers and very finally, I'm at on behalf of students. Let me thank you for 
a children's favorite topic about unman unmanned aerial vehicle. You start from the history of flight and you move on to aerodynamics about propellers, wings, pulses, flight controller. And finally, you came to this unmanned aerial vehicle, how it functions. I'm certain students was listening to you with so much of enthusiasm. It was indeed a great knowledge sharing, sir. And I'm, uh, if students, if you have any sort of doubt from your perspective, you can definitely chat and ask, sir. I can hear, I can see hundreds of thanks coming up, sir. Yeah, let me actually take the answers in this question. Any doubt? Yeah. Uh, parts described by the air around the propeller helix, yes, obviously. RPM is called rotations per minute. Yeah, uh, not only in recent, in, sir, in recent planes have turbines taken the place of propellers. No, it's not the case. See, the propeller turbines are mainly utilized in jet engines to enhance the usage of I mean, the, the, the engines. Turbines are actually part of engine. Propeller is a different thing, right? Um, AV is called unmanned vehicle. Wing is it's similar, but it is actually a complicated propping wing. Really is uh, depends upon a uh, variety of mechanisms. You could actually center of pressure needs a lot of mathematical things, so it is more like center of mass, which you studied in your 12th and 10th and 12th standard. Uh, except now you have to actually get the pressure. I mean, you have to tell pressure is not actually a single, uh, it's not actually a uh, it doesn't act at a particular point. It uh, it's more like it's a distributed one. We are talking about pressure. It actually a distributed one. So when you have a distributed force or load, you need to find out a point about which you can balance. I mean, similar to center of mass, you can have a center of pressure. Uh, motor and rotor. Yeah, well, uh, motor is something which uh, uh, the electric. Uh, energy is converted into a mechanical one, and rotor is mainly the propeller. Actually, uh, whatever I said is actually a very preliminary one. You can go through Google and a variety of forums to actually get the uh, whole procedure about uh, how to design. Really. There are a lot of thumb, thumb rules and things. If there is no air, then how we fly? It is not possible. Obviously, uh, it is. I mean, is it better to have a plane wing flapping mechanism rather than a normal flight? It depends upon what the purpose is. Um, for flapping wing, the complications are there. Uh, even the interaction of air with the wing is complicated. So. I think many people are repeating the question. Uh, Questions and very much for students for really. Uh, uh, there are too many questions. I don't know what to do. Can you just guide me? How can the UAV be recharged during the flight? It is not recharging. We use the wind energy to fly, like the Albatross. The Austrian thruster related is mainly <coughs> it's more of uh, fluid mechanics uh, and uh, propulsion related uh, mathematics is there. Uh, in physics, in physically, what you can say is as the I mean, if the velocity is more. Like students, source person.
the planes cannot stop in here it will travel it cannot go uh you have to you have to have a large number of gear ratios to actually maximize the rpm and secondly the rpm the, the input rpm depends upon the ah sir i can do Uh, end thrusters is very good, but it is very small. Thank it you is. very much, sir. Okay, I can stop now. I'm stopping the share. Uh, thank you all for listening. Uh... I think it is the No, I, I didn't actually get anything what it I think I think there is a connectivity problem. I think there is a connectivity problem. Nothing yeah, is uh, Marina some uh, your address. Hello. Shaju, her yeah. uh, voice is not clear. Yeah, yeah, she her voice is not coming. That I told her. Marina, did you listen what I said? I'm, I'm no, I don't know what. Okay. Yes, sir. And yes, very much, sir, for clearing most of that no, okay. session, sir. One hour, our session is over. It was a. So I was trying to think. Okay, I was trying to thank the full session, an interesting topic for students. About unmanned aerial vehicle from the beginning, from the history of flight, you were explaining to them very age appropriately. Listening to you, uh, their their doubt. Thank you. Uh. Thank you, sir, for this sharing of knowledge. Okay, thank you very much. I think there are a lot of questions they are putting forward. So right now, I I think the time is not there, and I would like to thank you all for giving me a opportunity to discuss. And if they have any doubts, I think they can put to you, and then I can answer if it is. Okay, okay. sir. Thank you. Okay, okay, the Alan. For the thank you, sir. Talk. Thank you. students you must notice one thing yesterday also it was all so time bound you should understand the value of time when great people great scientists great doctors when they are showing us they're showing the value of our time also these are small things which you also need to learn as you grow up now i next move on to the next speaker for the day uh, dr shaijumon cs Dr. Shaijumon Sears is currently working as Associate Professor of Economics in the Department of Humanities at the Indian Institute of Space Science and Technology. Asia's first space university is as deemed university under Department of Space, Government of India. Dr. Shaijumon has secured his PhD from University of Kerala. He is a Fulbright Scholar as well as Freeman Fellow. as fulbright scholar from united states education foundation of india he was a research fellow at the claremont graduate university california usa and has done his research on oligopoly marketing structure in agricultural markets as freeman fellow he was visiting professor at the pitzer college california he has secured his masters degree with first rank and gold medal in analytical economics from university of kerala in the year 1996 his current research focus is on space economics network economics technology diffusion and development indian economics climate economics and neuro economics he has published more than 30 research papers in internationally peer reviewed journals and books he has also published more than 50 article in popular journals and newspapers He is currently awarded a national project by Indian Council of Social Science Research, that is ICSSR, in the category of novel and path-breaking major research project, namely 
lifeline of remote india that is a study of telemedicine units in india Dr. Shaijimon is a member of several academic bodies, including the Working Group member of Kerala State Planning Board, Editorial Board member of the Journal of Agricultural Economics, Extension and Rural Department, and the International Journal for Research in Social Science. He is also a member of Indian Society of Agricultural Marketing and Fulbright Alumni Association. He is one of the peer review board member of the Journal of Advancement in Science and Technology Research, Herald Journal of Geography and Regional Planning, and the Journal of Agricultural and Crop Research, JAS. Yes, ma'am, you can cut short. <laughs> So again, again, it is not audible. Yes. I think your mic has some problem, maybe. I was reading about Shaijiman sir become to Sarga Shetra through Sarga Shetra Shetra also. Okay, today economic impact of Indian space program. I welcome you. Sir, yeah. to address the students. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Marina, for that uh, wonderful introduction. Uh, I, 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 I hope uh, I'm audible to all. Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Very nice. Good afternoon. I think as uh, yesterday, uh, someone was pointing out, like, you know, our registrar was pointing out, it is a nice time to sleep, right? Usually we sleep in the afternoon uh, with this high-packed, power-packed, jam-packed lectures of different technical notes that are coming and bumping on you. And then you guys are actually kind of like, you know, in the sleepy mode, maybe like, you know, technical lectures. So let me, let me go to from the very technical lecture that you just heard, like, you know, very wonderful lecture that you just heard. I'm just going into discuss about something little general. Maybe in between, maybe another technical lecture is coming in the evening, like you know, very important lecture. So in between, I I supposed to give this lecture on, on Friday because of one of our uh, you know uh, res uh, resource persons, like you know, had got to engaged in some urgent business. So then I thought I'll give this lecture today. Anyway. Uh, so let me share my screen to you. Hope uh, it is visible to you all. Is it visible? Yes or no? Yes, right? Okay. So I am going to talk about socioeconomic impacts of Indian space program. How the space program is impacting the society and economy of the country. That is what I'm going to talk about. So that's why I said, you know, a little different topic. This is also very important. So in the end, I'll tell you why this is very important for scientists and engineers and then who wanted to be, who wanted to pursue as scientists and engineers in, in space. So uh, first, just understand about India. So you would wonder about when you hear about India. It is a three trillion dollar economy. That means the world's sixth largest economy. India is such a massive country, the sixth largest economy in the world. 60% of Indian population are in agriculture sector, but 60% of income is from services sector. That's what a very, very interesting thing that I'll tell you a little later what it is. 60% of people depends on their livelihood in agriculture sector. But if you look at the national income of total people, 60% of income are coming from services sector. 
72 percent of population are in villages how many villages 5.75 lakhs villages they are in rural area 72 percent of our indian population we have only less than one percent of world trade but india is the second largest market or india is actually having 18 percent of world population we are actually one of the biggest countries in terms of population like the second largest market and second largest populous country in the world 60 percent of our population is less than 35 years of age like you you people like you know this is india is the youngest country in the world in that sense india is a country which is actually having inhabiting by largest number of youth population in the world 60 percent of population is less than 35 years of age out of this whatever you talk about this 100 and 35 crores, 60% is less than 35 years of age. 26% of people are living below poverty line on the other side. If you look, about 26% of people are living below poverty line means they are very, very, very poor. Poor people also living in there in India. Look at this figure. 20.6% of the world's poor are living in India. India is one of the poorest countries also in that sense. World's one-fifth of the poor people are living in India. This is what is India. That's why I said wonder that is India. On the one side, you have everything. On the other side, you just see the, the figures, like what is going on. Like one-fifth of India's population is, you know, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, one-fifth of the population, one-fifth of world's poor is living in India. 50% of world's malnourished children are in India. Aspiring big to become $5 trillion economy by 2025. By the year 2025, we wanted to enhance our GDP or our national income. Maybe you don't know much about those like, you know, figures like the terms GDP and national income and all, but still it is just you understand that it is the total income making by all people of the country in a particular year. Just understand like that. So right now it is about 3 trillion US dollars that is equivalent to 200 lakhs crores Indian rupees. So which we wanted to achieve about $5 trillion economy by the year 2025. This is what we are aspiring. So what we have and what we want that to be. That's what I just said. Okay. So India is a developing country, as everyone knows. One-fifth of world's poor are living in India. More population and less resources. We have more population, but our resources are very, very less. We have only 2.4% land area of the world. We have only 2.4% land area of the world. And then largest youth population, as I said, uh, largest youth population also uh, that is there in, in India. The major challenge of India is convert our population as human resource and acquire the capability of critical technologies are the only way for achieving developed country status and thereby providing better socioeconomic status of the people of the country. So the real challenge of the, of the country is how we manage these two. On the one side, we have many population. We have actually 65% of our people are less than 35 years of age. On the other side, we have only very, very less resources. But we wanted to achieve the developed country status by 2050. That's what our aim. So how are we going to achieve? Okay. Before that, let us discuss something about industrial revolutions. You would have heard about industrial revolutions. The fourth industrial revolution is going on right now in the world. First industrial revolution, you know that from the year 1784, uh, 1784, and that was kind of like you know mechanization, steam power, uh, weaving loom, and stuff like that. Second industrial revolution, like you know, industry 2.0. And that actually came in 1870 with mass production, assembly of uh, assembly line, uh, you know, electrical energy, such kind of things came. And then you can see that that revolutionized the industrial uh, production of the world. Third industrial revolution came from 1969 onwards, like, you know, automation, computer, computers, electronics. So those kind of things actually really revolutionized the entire industry of the world. The fourth industrial revolution today and which is actually something around like, you know, uh, later, later date of 1980s, which started industry 4.0. This is actually what, you know, the world of internet. And this is all, this is, the, this is the revolution which is going on right now. So if you are not grabbing the opportunity, whatever that is generating because of this revolution, India cannot achieve this developed country status. India cannot actually come out of this poverty conditions 
of the country so india has to grab the opportunities by using its limited resources but we have abundant popular population and we have youngest resource youngest population so we have to use that for to make use of this benefits of the ever growing the industrial revolution for this is what actually this is where the space technology is very 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 important i will tell you uh, how the, this is going to be important look at the critical technologies of fourth industrial revolution you know very well about this you would have heard about this artificial intelligence data analytics internet of things 5g technology quantum computing space technology robotics all these technologies are actually already in except one or two and then they are actually started revolutionizing the world certain countries have a lot of command over these technologies like china or us and all that's why you would have seen that china and us are fighting each other for the technological supremacy of the world even during this covid 19 time also they both wanted to show the world that we are actually in the forefront of developing technology we can only really actually lead the world or think things like that that you would have you would have seen that from the newspaper and news as and something like that so for india to become a global power these technologies to give power to our youth this is what the great or important point these technologies has to give power to our youth our youth has to get power from these technologies then only actually what our country can become a very very developed country our country can become on par with maybe something like you know a scandinavian countries or like us or some european union countries and all so we have to use such technologies you can see in the list one of the very very important technology in the list is space technology why this is very important in this list because all other technologies you need if you need space technology to control all other technologies this is what the importance of the space technology for you need space technology know how for many other things that related to other technologies or you need the space technology bridging for to bridge the effective use of the other technologies for the development of a country that's why space technology is very 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 important so what is space technology everyone knows that i am not going to tell you that what is space technology space technology is the technology developed by space science or the aerospace industry for the use in space flight satellites or space exploration space technology includes spacecraft satellites space stations and supporting infrastructure equipment and procedures and space warfare everything this is what yk says including space warfare this is this is what you would have seen that you know like you know anti satellites missile and all testing by different countries so this is the world right now so this is uh, so that's why this technology is very 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 important and then you know the uh, for other technologies also this is very important so moving on and how space technology uh, you know how space program benefits human beings okay a space program can provide direct benefits to the individuals and citizens of a nation that you know that you know what are the benefits they are giving so the pursuit of these benefits uh, actually uh, uh, benefits is expressed in three rationales so one is actually advancement of scientific and technical skills or capacity next is inducement of economic growth improvement of standard of living in this three ways that you know you can see that space programs benefit human beings one scientific and technological skills and capacity addition next is inducement to economic growth of a country technologies any technology including space technology till induce the economic growth of a country next is actually improvement of standard of living so this 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 is uh, this is how that actually space technology benefits human beings in addition to the goals of a development of technology for social benefit so you can see that those reasons were there but in, but there are various other reasons that uh, you know that countries pursue for space technology or space development that is actually international prestige you would have you would have heard about this cold war time and all russia and uh, ussr and usa were fighting for the supremacy in the world that you would have heard about that one of the technologies that they were fighting actually in the, this was the space technology international prestige national pride when you have space technology capability it is a kind of a national pride that's why many of you youngsters wanted to become a space scientist you wanted to work with space technology so that's what it's kind of a national pride and challenging technology 
regional leadership of a country if you have space technology like india india is one of the six space faring nations of the world leading space faring nations of the world so you will get a regional leadership everybody will admire you uh, other countries will come with satellites and you are going to send the satellites it is a kind of a diplomacy technology diplomacy between countries spin offs you would have heard about this word spin offs what is spin offs spin off means when you develop a technology you will end up in developing various other technologies so you would have heard about this uh, jaipur food you know for using for ampute um, uh, you know leg amputation and things like that so what is this material the material actually invented by isro only that material like later on innovated by a company and then they started making this jaipur food which is very strong and less weight so such kind of spin offs many spin offs in the process of making space technology or in the process of accessing space so you will come across lot of spin offs of technology that is beneficial for societal and economic development of a country okay so little bit about the you know that the indian space story you you see that you know this person like uh, dr vikram sarafai is the father of indian space program what did he say about the space program we do not have the fantasy of competing with economically advanced nations our space program is not for competition with other countries like the other like many other countries do like maybe china is competing with us us may be competing with china and european union is competing with other countries but we don't have such competition we don't want such competition but we are convinced that if we are to play a meaningful role nationally we must be second to none in the application of advanced technologies in the real problems of man and society so we are convinced that we should have mastery over such technologies which is giving or which is solving the real problems of man and man and society one of the technology is space technology that's why right from the early age or right from the time of just after the time of independence itself we realized the importance of this technology even though we were having lot of problems during that time in the form of inflow of immigrants from other other countries and food problem and poverty and such kind of problems were there after partition of the country in 1947 but still we were actually right from that time onwards we were giving more importance to space technology and development you can see that so that that's why because we realized that this is the one technology which we can use it for solving the social and economic problems of the country solving the real problems of man and society that's what the vision of you know that the space technology so indian space program actually indian space program has contributed significantly to the country's economic growth supported beneficial societal applications lots and lots of societal applications during the covid 19 time also many many so applications of space technology developed by isro which is using in the ground level for assess for controlling the epidemic and for 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 introducing various measures to control this epidemic we i will describe certain things later on help to build broader broader scientific and technical cap capacities and infrastructure so indian space program has contributed significantly to the country's development space research in india as i told you it started as early as in 1961 itself we actually on 21st november 1963 by launching a tiny american sounding rocket named nikke apache from tuba in trivandrum in kerala that actually they uh, uh, launched this the sounding rocket nikke apache rocket from from turls uh, tuba trivandrum and then from there onwards the space uh, you know race started the space the scientific experiment started from 1963 onwards indian space organization came only in 1969 august 15 1969 the prime objective of isro is to develop space technology and its and application to various national needs that's what i said space technology is for various national needs that's what the priority it is one of the six largest space agencies in the world isro is one of the six largest space agencies in the world the department of space and the space commission were set up in 1972 and isro was brought under department of space on june 1st 1972 so there is a separate department that is named department of space which is which just came in 1972 and isro is under the under uh, you know this uh, uh, space department department of space in from 1992 onwards 
mission and vision i told you already the vision the summary of the vision from the words of uh, you know dr vikram sarafai but right now our vision is that you know to harness space technology for national development while pursuing space science research and planetary explorations so while pursuing this explorations pursuing scientific research and scientific developments so the primary aim of space technology development of the country is national development that's what i said this is very important for national development this is very important for solving the real problems facing by the people of the country a developing country like india so many missions are there i just put it at the, all the missions for you to read in that one of the missions that fifth one you can see that space based applications for societal development right you know it's a, it's a, the main one of the main objectives itself one of the mission itself is the society's development society's development societal development so this is a very important solving the social problems of the country solving the economic problems of the country so that's why i said this is this technology is very very important for the country the declared primary objective of indian space program or indian space mission is to achieve self reliance in space technology and to execute program missions for the socio economic development of the country this is what the declared primary objective of uh, you know space space uh, technology of the country or space technology development of the country according to professor sadish dawan after vikram sarabhai professor sadish dawan was the you know chairman of isro indian space program has now two main objectives derived from a matching of the inherent capabilities of satellites in orbit around the earth with two major national needs again national needs rapid development of mass communication and education especially in widely dispersed rural communities and timely survey and management of country's natural resources this is what i said earlier we have like you know we our our our, our people are actually living major people even today 72% of our people are living in rural areas in villages so then you know you have to get connectivity you have to give education to the people of that region you have to you know difficult locations are there in the country if you would have noticed that india is the only one country in the world that which has all kinds of terrains in the country right from glaciers to deserts to like you know deciduous forests thick forests and everything we have midlands and highlands everything we have all these areas if you wanted to have proper governance you have to have the command of the space technology otherwise you cannot introduce policies for the economic development of the country that's why this technology is very very important so factors contributed to the development of space technology in india there are many many factors like you know as i i as i said i'm not reading everything like lot of like you know neto network with expatriates effective use of available budget and resources linkage with other sectors this is all very very important so space technology is kind of a link technology for other sectors if you wanted to actually capture if you want that other technology to be effectively implemented in the country you need space technology you would have noticed that right now this all these online education going on and all these online meetings and other things are going on most of these things are actually supporting by using the space technology so so this is the these are the reasons that india actually uh, factors actually india developed space technology in the country economic and social development is characterized to through three generalized national goals in india one is actually we wanted to produce more we wanted to produce more products so in particular life sustaining product, products uh, you know we wanted to enhance the productivity in the country for that you need space technology increase standard of living of the country so for that you you need space technology like higher standard of living like skill jobs increased education you wanted to reduce the total cost of the economy total cost of the country you wanted to give services to the people so for all these things you need actually space technology expand market and economies you need to expand your market because you have huge amount of population so you need to expand your market so space technology is a key factor for achieving all the above uh, this thing producing more and increasing standard of living and expanding the market so how it benefits us indian economy through this technology you can reach the unreached so if some person is actually in a very remote location maybe you cannot access through roads you know that even now certain villages in india you don't have proper pakka roads so in that sense you can reach the unreached people so you can give services to such kind of people and you can you can have an eye in the sky in terms of security in terms of communication it is kind of satellite is kind of like you know eye in the sky 
he is watching for navigation for guidance everything that you know a satellite is watching the earth like you know all satellites watching india so then we can have all kinds of security like you would have heard recently like you know india china issues in the border so what happened finally like you know indian satellites only captured the images that what chinese troops actually uh, came inside the territory of india so from that they gave an information to defense department and they proacted like that you know lot of lot of things like you know we may be sleeping in the night but the satellites are not uh, sleeping and they are working all day and night and then this is kind of a watchdog eye in the sky ease of doing business in the country i yesterday registrar was mentioning about this thing lot of business like you know opportunities that you can bring in by en enhancing the space technology capability in the country so if you have space technology your business will enhance and lot of like data it is available through space technology your data analytics uh, expertise will improve then you know what you can do is you can actually business people can access to those and they can have good business in the country forward and backward linkage yes, this is very very important what is forward and backward linkage when you try to develop space technology on the one hand because of space technology your communication is enhancing your 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 services are enhancing your remote sensing capabilities enhancing your agriculture sector getting lot of lot of uh, you know benefits all these things are getting from the as a forward linkage what is the backward linkage while you develop this technology there are lot of backward industries are also developing in the country so you wanted components for the rocket development you wanted components for the satellite development you want electronics you want lot of gardens uh, you know machines and such kind of things you wanted to improve infrastructure for testing and other kinds of things for the space capability so when you do all these things your backward linkages also expand that will give lot of employment opportunities lot of products lot of spin offs and all these kinds of developments which will lead to the development of the country another important thing is actually resource planning this is the only technology which you can plan the resources of the country efficiently you would have seen that you know this kind of like urban planning or like traffic or like you know planning of your groundwater situation understanding your groundwater situation your fish fog if you wanted to know about how much fish is available in the sea what type of fish is available or if you wanted to know the various other kinds of resources under earth or over earth or under under water or whatever you have to use space technology from through satellites you can you will wonder that you know you can understand all these kinds of things through the through resource planning of you by using space technology networking and connectivity it is very very important through space technology you'll get networking you'll get connectivity you can get connected to many people connected to many institutions you can have business you can have governance you can have engagements and one to one meetings and contacts and such kind of things you are no matter what where you are in the world you can have you can have improved connectivity between people between institutions this is one of the very very important benefit of uh, space technology improving welfare of the people i told you all through all these kinds of benefits your welfare of the people also improve you just simple example atm machine your atm machine is working because of there is space technology it is a kind of a vsat terminal so you if you wanted to work this atm machine so you you it is kind of a giving welfare to the people how it is giving welfare to the people people need not go to bank at the time of banking hours by spending his or her own time and then you know waiting there for long time and all you can go any day night or day or any time to go to atm machine and take money this is very this is improving the welfare of the people i am just saying one a small simple example which dth so all these dth connections uh, tele uh, you know uh, 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 television connections or mobile and such kind of things and all in larger way actually it is moving towards space technology so space technology is improving the welfare of the people increase in productivity because of space data available because of remote sensing data available or because of uh, the resources planned in the country so you can improve the productivity of the country the people actually or the business people who come to the country for business or if you do some kind of business your productivity will enhance because of this technology resources also you can enhance you can bring resources from other country i i i think you would have heard about helium 3 so why we need this moon explorations we, we people think that actually what we are just going going to moon as a fantasy it is not actually we are we are not going moon for fantasy and all our ultimate aim is what along with other countries our ultimate aim is to claim certain area in 
in in moon but we cannot climb the area right now because moon or celestial bodies are the property of everybody that's what un convention say but even though it is right now it is uh, you know the property of everyone maybe at a later date it can become the property of some people or some countries so therefore we don't want it to be the second person or second country we don't want it to be the final layer, final you know line that waiting to enter there so we want it to be the front liners so that's why we are exploring right now so along with other countries space firing nations we are also exploring uh, you know moon we you know about our chandrayaan missions mars missions so we wanted to bring such kind of resources like helium 3 and you know we wanted to bring back here and we wanted to actually give energy security to, for the country okay there are various other problems related to technology for energy security by using helium 3 and that i am not explaining all those maybe some other faculty member will explain all those things but what i am saying is to enhance the resources of earth of you of the country then you need to have explorations also who knows that some day that you know people will go and stay there in there in moon especially a country like india where you know only we, we have only 2.4% land area and about 18% of the population are living here so your density of population is very high we don't know whether you know we are going some of our people are going some of you sitting here that youngsters you are going there and going to stay there in moon or mars and all we don't know maybe technology will come very soon i am i'm sure that technology will come very soon that you can go to moon or mars and stay there and bring back resources and the space tourism is already on people started going to space space tourism for the kind of like you know space tourism kind of activities and all so what i meant is uh, there are a lot of benefits that you know space technology can bring for society and economy i just said some examples so uh, one sector by sector i am not explaining everything because of lack of time so agriculture sector just some examples like you know that 60% of indian population are dependent on agriculture many people out of total population on 35 crores 60% of that is actually depending on indian agriculture agriculture forms that means actually what agriculture sector development is very important for larger section of the population agriculture forms the basis of indian food supply not only that employment that they are providing for all people of the country the food is providing supplying by agriculture only so soil conditions water availability weather extremes climate change all these country, all these things are problematic for farmers for production of food so therefore it has to be set right so for that you need space technology otherwise you cannot actually control all these so it is very important for food security of the country remote sensing satellite provide key data for monitoring soil Area estimation, snow cover, drought, and crop development. Yesterday, Registrar Sir was actually explained all these things in very detail. I'm not going into details of all those. Accurate and timely information about agriculture output, weather information, soil conditions, crop diseases, land and water resources planning. All these, you name it. What are the activities in agricultural development? You can see that for all those, you know that uh, uh, things. Uh, space technology has a role to play this is very very important so this important sector we have to develop by using space technology industry and business take industry and business how it is actually benefiting i told explained you already forward and backward linkages when you do the space technology when you develop space technology spin offs decline in cost of production and maximize profit for the entrepreneurs so that is very very important bridge technology and enabler for many other technologies this is kind of a bridge technology you can enable many other technologies by using actually what space technology ease of doing business will improve in the in the country track supply chains you can track the supply chains in the country from where the production is happening up to up to, up to what destination it is going all these things you can actually track by using space technology finding new resources i said about find for industrial development you need new resources and you can find new resources services and trade look at financial services stock market you can you imagine that you know if one second time if stock markets get off what will happen to the country you can't even imagine that because you know completely controlling or all the services of you know stock markets are or connectivity services are giving by satellites only dedicated satellites so that is very very important so it is actually controlling is satellite is controlling the entire finance of the country 
So space technology is controlling the entire finance of the country in that way. If that technology fails sometime, what will happen? The whole economy, the whole people get get affected. The complete control, complete country is gone. So that is important. That you should understand. Banking and insurance sectors. This, this is very very important for insurance for assessing things and assessing damages of crop or like you know assessing damages of your house or something because of natural calamity and all. So you need space technology. Then only you can assess the insurance cost and such things. E-governance, I already told you, many states already actually implemented during this COVID time, e-governance system by using space technology. Telemedicine, I'll come to that telemedicine, what it is. Tele-education, village resource centers. What is village resource centers? You are enabling in rural village areas. ISRO actually started village resource centers to give facilities to the people of that region. Like, you know, you are giving information about land. You're giving information about weather to that locality. You are in, in, in giving information about the soil of that region through the satellite images, through the satellite information. So in the village resource centers, if one person goes, you will get all kinds of information that you need. So you have the depository of resources there. So you just go there and give that uh, access to that resources. GPS, you know that GPS, India G developed in its own GPS that is actually Bhuvan. You can go to the uh, NRC website and you can see that what is this Bhuvan, you can see. Like, you know, GPS of like Google or the world, other countries like American GPSs, we have our own GPS boom and slowly, maybe in near future, all our navigation and, you know, travel and such kind of things will control, will going to be controlled by boom and only boom and, uh, GPS system. Travel and tourism, you know, space technology is helping a lot. Like, you know, that is the travel, you know, the plane, the airplane and, uh, travel or like, you know, tourism, all these areas, space technology is contributing a lot. Communication services, data services, defense services for the defense. So they are giving all kinds of services in this modern world. You need the help of space technology to have a proper, efficient defense in the country. That's why we need the uh, you know, space technology. Creation of trade surplus in the country. That means enhancing productivity, urban planning, knowledge economy. See, you, you, you would have heard like, you know, one week back our new uh, you know, education policy introduced in the country. In that, you know, the primary aim is to convert our country into a knowledge economy by 2035. So in that, you know, space technology have a bigger, very, very big role, huge role to play to convert Indian economy into a knowledge economy. So, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, many, many other, uh, you know, uh, um, effects are there. You look at the telemedicine concept. What is telemedicine? So it's a kind of a remote remote medicine, access to health remote way. So you won't, you cannot actually, a doctor cannot travel all the way to an interior village in the in the country or like you know you may not find a very good hospital in the interior villages of the country or at least in the villages also you won't find very good hospital so in now because of space technology you don't have to have good hospitals there you will get all kinds of services through consultation online through the telemedicine you can actually the doctor may be sitting in some some good hospitals in in some parts of the country or world abroad so you can just like, you know, you can consult to that doctor at a prefix time and the doctor will come online. You can see the doctor and you can talk like we are talking. I'm talking to you right now like that. You can talk. Also, you can conduct surgeries through online. Now in Kerala and different parts of the country and all in different, different hospitals, they started this uh, through Trilly Medicine. They are actually conducting surgeries. The, the surgeon may be, uh, you know, sitting there in U.S. or in other states or some other places. But surgery is happening in one of the laboratories there in rural area. So you can do that right now. You can actually transfer your X-ray, your ECG report, everything from here to the doctors and the doctors can give advice. Telemedicine is not only through call. Right now in Kerala, we are introducing telemedicine in the form of call, telephonic call. That is not only the telemedicine. Telemedicine has different dimensions. This is one of the important dimensions that, you know, you like your sitting before a doctor, you can have consultation with the doctor, you can get all the services of a doctor through telemedicine. So this is a very revolutionary concept. These are the technologies behind that from where it is coming and how it is going and all. SATCOM based telemedicine connectivity. It is actually Risro taken initiative and then they have established telemedicine connectivity in India through a single point to point system and multi point system where a doctor can consult and hospital can consult to different locations or a doctor can consult to one to one, one person to other person and all. So that kind of systems you can introduce by using this, this technology. 
and next is actually what you know isro telemedicine network we right now 245 hospitals in 205 district rural hospitals and 400 super specialty hospitals they have actually established the telemedicine facilities with the help of isro so this is a very important thing so this is kind of re revolutionizing uh, you know uh, health in the country even during the covid time everyone understood the value of telemedicine because you know because of social distancing is practice you can't go to even to the hospitals so when you are not in a very urgency you can wait for telemedicine consultancy so in future for urgent services also it will be available for sure that's what the importance of telemedicine you can look at the tele uh, you know tele education concepts through remote location through by using dedicated satellites like edusat that we have you can you can have you know education uh, you can provide education to the remotely located people of the country so this is very very important so if so maybe in rural areas what is the important problem is infrastructure of or schooling infra schools and those things are not available in the rural areas so when it is not available in the rural areas you can you don't need to have such kind of infrastructure when you have edusat facilities you can you can actually transmit this classes through through this dedicated satellites that's what happening right now so disaster management another important area so very important area yesterday uh, this sir mentioned about uh, director also mentioned about this the how this sort of technology is using for disaster management by using dedicated satellite you can actually evacuate people you know that from where this right now maybe uh, the you know uh, uh, depression is predicted uh, in the sea and then how we are predicting we are predicting by using satellite images we know the wind movements by 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 using the wind movements by using various models mathematical models that you can actually predict this maybe the next lecture the the you know the the professor will be explaining about how they are doing that in you know, the climatology and all so by using the te space technology you can actually predict the weather and also you can use it for evacuation purposes and when everything uh, during the time of maybe like at the time of earthquake or something everything would have destroyed or flood time so you don't have any communication but you can have satellite communication that time you can have satellite communication because satellite will not get disturbed you know destroyed because of you know the destruction in the earth so you can have the satellites and then you can actually ground if the ground station ground station also be made it in such a way that the, the signals are receiving not only in india but elsewhere the world also very other various other countries also we have signal receiving mechanisms so isro is having sharing you know uh, uh, having a sharing mechanism with other other space entities as well as the countries we have our own space you know stations controlling stations actually you know tracking stations established in other countries so we have we can use this technology for disaster management and disaster management uh, you know in a smaller way if you see that these are the this is the summary of actually what how isro is actually administering disaster management support programs in the country various programs are there for supporting disaster management i would say that i can very confidently say that isro's technology or satellites are very very important role have a very very important role during any kinds of disasters that is happening right now whether it is flood or earthquake or like you know calamity like covid or anything that is actually isro's technology is having a big role to play okay so space capabilities like communication navigation and imaginary imaginary satellites have become uh, an irreplaceable irrepe irreplaceable economic pillar in the economic modern society so it is actually an important pillar economic pillar it is kind of an economic pillar only so do you need for to economy to get boost you need the space capabilities they offer near instantaneous communication no matter how remote you locate navigation signals gps services uh, you know support uh, support a precision agriculture disaster management services all these services that actually what giving by uh, you know this thing and coming to an important point that what do you know that how much we spend for the space exploration this is a very very important question that we have to look for so we are one of the i said six space faring important six space faring nation look at the budget year 2019 budget of uh, india us china russia and european space agency india is spending just 1.88 billion us dollars that is equivalent to about maybe you won't understand 1.88 billion us dollars what it is if you convert it that to indian rupees it is roughly around 13000 crores 
yes 13000 crores annually that too also for the last 5 years only we are getting like you know the government is giving is so about more than about 8000 crores last year we got about 13000 crores so this just 13 by using just 13000 crores you are doing all these activities you are actually facilitating everything on par with the other nations like usa look at usa space budget annually 22.5 billion us dollars china 8 billion us dollars russia 7.77 billion us dollars european space agency is 7.45 billion us dollars look at india india is one of the important countries in the world in space uh, technology we are spending only or we, you know we are spending only 1.88 billion us dollars which is actually what 2009 10 exactly it was 12473 crores 13000 crores i said about 2021 budget okay 13000 some 500 crores this is actually 2019 10 budget if you look only 12473 crores which is about 0.3% central government budget just 0.3% of central government budget only see if you look at defense and other areas you can see more than 5 6% about 5% of total budget is spending for uh, you know defense and all you can see but here in space technology development such an important technology which is actually important for every sectors of the economy we are spending only just 0.3% of uh, total central government budget by using that small resources we are actually maximizing or optimizing the entire explorations in their space technology development in the country so this is very important so what is just little bit about what is space economy this is very very important 1960 only two countries could be considered as space faring nations in by 2018 about 80 countries have achieved some level of space capability you can see that we have only about something around 203 204 countries in the world out of that already 80 country had achieved some level of space capability but very limited countries only having launching capability but many countries makes satellites small satellites nano satellites and such kind of thing so 80 countries have already achieved some kind of space capability and during 1960s only russia only ussr and usa was actually fighting each other for supremacy of space technology but now about 80 countries are there because they all know that the technology is very important for economic development of their country indian space industry had a barely 3% of share in the rapidly growing global space economy global space economy means you know the economic activities generated because of space economy in the world is something around 360 billion us dollars in 2019 so in that only 3% share only we are contributing india is contributing so the business is actually happening in the world it is ever growing huge growth is there in the space business space economy but indian contribution is very very less that's why we you know we need to we need to expand our space technology more space business more then only we can actually what play a bigger role in the world economy so that's what we are trying to do right now okay right now the policies are shifting and we are trying to do only 2% of this market was for rocket and remaining is about 75% is actually what for satellite based based services so more the economic activities are generating from the services providing from the data which is generating from satellites so you are sending satellites in different forms like communication or remote sensing or such kind of satellites you are getting huge amount of data from that and that data actually you can entrepreneurs can use for business so like that if you look or 95% of this economy 360 billion dollar economy if you look 95% is generating from the satellite based services like communication navigation remote sensing all kinds of services so from that this economy is generating indian industry is unable to compete because till now its role has been mainly that of suppliers of components and subsystem so india is kind of india could not actually play to or compete to such kind of huge business because you know in other countries if you look at us or european union or other countries you can see that largely private parties are contributing a lot to space business and space industry look at indian industries do not have the resources or the technology to undertake independent space projects for the kind that us companies such as spacex you would have heard about spacex company that is coming in a big way they are already sent several satellites about 100 150 200 satellites they already sent uh, nano satellites so like that they are going to send about 1000 satellites 
very soon in in one year time they are going to send uh, send thousand satellites so that's a huge business for every small company they are sending satellites for every small company can have their own satellite that's a business so you have your own satellite your own nano satellite you develop a nano satellite and give it to a give it to a company and the company can control and then they can control everything and then they can have business so that is what you know we can't do that because you know our our space sector is largely in a private investment we get private i mean public investment we get private support from the from companies and all in the form of we have the partnership but largely actually it's actually under the control monopoly of isro and monopoly of space department but a huge market potentially is there in india because space you know indian indian market is huge second for largest populous country in the world therefore market is very huge business is flourishing exploding very much therefore we have a huge opportunity opportunity there in india as well as abroad in space business now space is actually slowly opening to private sector already the government has announced and the policy as part of atmanirbhar bharat program that prime minister announced so that he announced about this privatization of space uh, sector also uh, through you know the finance minister announced in details they can make use of isro facilities now isro is having facilities so the private party is going to test they can use the launch facilities they can be part with uh, isro and can make produce satellites control the data they can have business you can get access to data that is generated from isro and then that you can actually use for businesses so like that it is slowly privatizing and like us and other countries we want that to you know uh, control the larger share of space business so that's what we are trying to do right now okay so you also have the opportunity india already announced a new space agency space agency in the same uh, regulator indian national space promotion and authorization center in space which will actually act as a facilitator and regulator for the private parties if a private sector like people like you if you have an idea about the space sector you can go and approach to this in space and then they will actually help you how you can uh, you know uh, join hands with isro and do the business or do the activities do the explorations and things like that allowing private parties will will help isro to concentrate on science research and development so if you look at right now isro is not getting much time to you know uh, concentrate on research development and interplanetary explorations because country needs a lot they need more Uh, you know navigation communication or remote sensing satellites and all so every time they are just sending satellites but they they are they are not getting enough time to concentrate on research development interplanetary explorations and strategic launches therefore now if you introduce private parties in this sector what is the advantage is isro can concentrate more on the you know space science research development interplanetary explorations and strategic services private parties can do the other uh, businesses also so new space policy also coming in already discussions are over it is in the in the in the uh, you know that consideration of parliament and the news we never had a, a space policy in the country the new space policy is coming because we are allowing private parties therefore we have to have a strong control over them we have to because it's a very strategic sector so therefore all kinds of policies we need so the, the policy actually kind of right reorient the space activities from a supply driven model to demand driven model means uh, till now it was kind of all the space technology is making generating by isro and is giving to the private parties or the companies or whatever or the people but now it is kind of demand driven model is coming so the private parties can actually think about many things and they can join hands with isro and can develop more technology and can invest in space business so huge amount of opportunities are coming uh, people students like you you have to be aware about that and only that you can actually grab this opportunities which is coming in a big way in this country it's it's a huge area it's a huge potential area which is coming so you should understand such kind of technologies and area and pursue your higher studies related to that then you know you can have good career and good uh, you know job uh, job in future okay uh, space technology during covid 19 times so i'm not de in detailing that you know that through telemedicine and through the data that is actually collected by the various satellites so we are in, uh, introducing in india we are introducing social distancing and such kind of policies even if you look at the co corona virus tracker which is publishing by the national government helping by isro only isro data only isro is collecting data for corona virus virus tracker by using its various stations and all so that is why you know every sphere 
you know that the, the space technology is actually helping the space technology otherwise we try put it in a different words it is uh, it is necessary for introducing such kind of policies effectively in the country so during covid 19 lots and lots of activities actually isro is doing for 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 effective implementation of policies to mitigate the effects of Uh, this pandemic spread in the country like as uh, isro also started studying about you know by using various atmospheric parameters and water levels and such kind of things you know that they are uh, measuring the pollution level or the measuring the the atmosphere levels and what kind of impact this this is actually made to the made to the society and the made to the made to the nature and uh, made to the water and such kind of things that also they are studying so by using different kinds of data which is available so you can also do right now you can also pursue such kind of things varieties of studies with different state governments using geospatial technology under bhuvan and all it is actually on the way uh, it is already started uh, like you know many enhanced capabilities are using for like earth observation navigation control guidance all kinds of systems data everything is using for controlling this covid 19 pan pandemic so satellite communications enabling doctors to connect to patients virtually to the launching of apps that they use gps satellite data and artificial intelligence technologies to monitor the implementation of social distancing measures effectively and connectively see look at this so this is how actually this is one example like doctors by using this technology the, by using the data you know you can implement you can implement various measures to control this disease okay so everyone uh, my my conclusion is going to be like this everyone has a, has space in the space everyone has space in the space space is not only for scientists and engineers space is for doctors space is for biologists space is for economists sociologists lawyers policy makers administrators politicians businessmen traders travelers commerce etc 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 space is for socio economic growth of societies communities and the countries you can everybody can have space that's why you would have wondered that what an economics person does in space that's what you know that's why i didn't say about you know when she introduced about me that i am an economist who is working there in space department why is that you would have understood right now so space is actually a space for everyone you can have space for everyone here so you you can accommodate everything like you know it is kind of a big interdisciplinary area if you have some kind of knowledge and idea and all you can connect it in any area how do you see lawyers can use space technology policy makers can use space technology sociologists administrative leaders politicians uh, businessmen traders travelers everything space for socio economic uh, growth of the communities and societies so to succeed in your mission you must have single minded devotion to your goal so that is what you need like you know whatever the technology so you are attending this if you have a single minded devotion if you get some idea somewhere when you listen some lectures you will get some kind of spark some kind of rise in your mind and then that will convert into innovation and invention and all that will be kind of multidisciplinary approach that's why from a different perspective i am also introducing the topic before you okay without your involvement you can't succeed with your involvement you can't fail also remember this so space is for everyone space is for everybody space us everybody to, space can accommodate everyone so think about that all the time all the very best and pursue a good career be very confident and then you know you get involved and very get very serious about what you do even if a small things you do you just be serious about that thing so that's what a famous quote from apj abdul kalam without your involvement you can't succeed with your involvement you can't fail at least you can ensure that you can't fail keep that thank you very much there is an interruption students don't worry so we'll be continuing okay no i i am done i am done with my lecture
Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm done. So if any questions are there, uh, I can, uh, I can, I'm happy because I'm happy to answer. I can't hear you, Marina. Your 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 voice is not coming. Maybe because you know, I'll I'll suggest something. You are logging in from two two accounts. Maybe that is the reason. Yeah, I can't hear you. I, we can't hear you. Your mic is off. Mike is off. Mike is off. Mike is off. Students, it's time for your doubt clearance. Okay, some students are chatting with some questions. So they are asking about some questions. Some questions I can see. They are asking about how to join ISRO and then what kind of studies they wanted to do. And one important thing is in plus one plus two, you just make sure that plus 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 one plus two, you just make sure that you know you are studying a subject with physics, chemistry, uh, physics and mathematics for sure. And then you know one important opportunity is IAST. And uh, after plus two. You can write IIT JE Advanced Examination, and then you can join IAST. IAST has wonderful, uh, wonderful subjects that you can actually pursue. That uh, you, we have the BTEC program, MTEC program, PhD program, and all. So here, those who join for BTEC program, you have the uh, very, very good opportunity to get into ISRO as scientists. So that is a one way. Another way is actually ISRO conducts this. Exams like you know, ISRO ISRO exams are they are conducting annually for scientists. So those who those who completed their BTEC and BSc Physics and all they conduct directly exams every year. So through that also you can apply and you can enter into ISRO, and you can enter into higher levels also. You get to go and pursue studies uh, different parts like you know uh, MSc uh, or MTech and PhD and such kind of things, and then you can actually come and uh, you can uh, join uh, ISRO. So that is another way. So different ways are there to join ISRO. Next, uh, next actually, uh, there are a lot of questions are coming. I can't even read uh, some. Sir, firstly, we have to clear JE mains. Okay, I I already said the answers. Uh, see about the Pokhran test and all they are asking, but I can't hear. I can't see everything running. Huge number of questions are coming. Dr. Shaiju, so Shaiju. thank you for your interest. I, I would suggest one thing. Dr. Shaiju, yes. Dr. Shaiju, can you hear me? Yes, Hello. sir. Hello, Dr. Shaiju. Yes, sir. Tell me, sir. Uh, since uh, we have time, if you don't mind, uh, try to answer some of the questions so that uh, you may be happy. Huh? Some questions I have to answer now? Yeah, yeah. Because we have time. But, uh, Okay, so any scope for astronomy in ISRO? One question. Definitely, there is a scope for astronomy. We are actually planning to have an astrosat very soon, and also interplanetary missions are there. Definitely, you need astronomer, astronomy, uh, uh, astronomic scientists. We need like definitely ISRO needs such kind of people. And then I can't even read. It is running fast this chat box. So that is the one problem. Maybe if you can, uh, sir, can I join ISRO through K KVPA exam? KVPA exam also you can join, but KV, through KVPA exam, you have to join for your degree course either in ISR or such kind of places. But in IAST, we won't accept KVPA exams. Through exams, we won't accept. We accept students only through, we take students only through IIT JE advanced. There is no other way to get in, get in IAST. For MTech and PhD, through various gate scores and other mechanisms are there. But KVPA scores, we won't accept. So why shouldn't actually someone is asking why why they are not combining ISRO and DRDO? So I am not answering that question. There is there is a 
technical technical answers involved in that i am not competent to answer that question maybe someone later on will will uh, saying someone is asking about uh, chandrayaan and spending money uh, yeah that is a good question actually chandrayaan definitely people say that why we spend money for such kind of explorations even newspapers when such uh, explorations happens on the one side people admire about people's pride will increase on the other side some people uh, come with very critic and say that okay why we are spending money for such kind of activities i explained in my presentation because you know we need to know the resources we wanted to find out resources and also our space in the country is very low we have only 2.4% of land area therefore actually what is needed is we wanted to find out another alternative so we need space in another planets if we can get space in another planets we can actually trans uh, transport some people to that planet also plus more resources we may get lot of resources from that rare resources rare minerals metals we get from such kind of planets so that's why we are spending that money so as a leading nation as a country which is having second largest populous country in the world we need more resources and we need to explore such things okay so uh, someone someone is act, uh, asking about uh, space debris it's a very important question uh, usually i am not answering it technically but i can answer it in a general way that is actually a very important thing it's a very important question also when we open up also uh, when we open up uh, in a space sector for private entities what will happen private parties huge number of private investors will come with lot of uh, satellites and they will be starting sending satellites uh, you know in the in the in the space like what they do in spacex uh, in the us and all on thousands of satellites when you do that after some time the life the life of sat satellite will come down and that will become a debris so that debris removing that debris from the space is a big issue so that is that uh, that everyone is discussing that that is actually a threat to the existing satellites also debris are uh, not only that you know it's a space debris actually polluting the environment space environment but also it is a big threat to the existing satellites so when some parts actually it will get uh, get in touch with some kind of satellites the entire satellite can get malfunction so that is also there so some kind of policy internationally international policies are there still that policy has to be introduced very efficiently in the world then only we can actually reduce the menace of space debris so in what way nasa and isro work together that is another question it is asking definitely there are a lot of areas isro and nasa is working so even in even in iast also there are a lot of collaborations are there uh, nasa funded projects through various universities like caltech and all we are also having joint collaboration with such universities and iast is working with some some scientists some faculty members of iias is also working with uh, nasa and isa and such kind of international agencies definitely isro is continuously working with uh, nasa for various missions uh, upcoming missions and all you would have seen that lot of satellites of nasa we are sending why because we are one of the cheapest cheapest in the sense that you know economically cheapest uh, space faring nation in the world because we can send satellite at a very cheaper cost compared to any other country in the world that is the most attractive feature of indian space program we are actually i told you about this budget of space space sector we have only very limited budget uh, and but in by using that budget we are very very competitive with other space faring nations that's why other countries are coming to india for sending satellites and helping helping the technological development and all because we can do it at a very very cheaper cost okay so samadna is asking how, what amount of je scores that you need to get admitted in iast that you please go to iast website you can see that all the last previous years admission how much is the average score that you need to score in you know pcm physics chemistry and mathematics how much you need to score on an average and on what basis that we take everything is there usually we get students in for general categories for all kinds of reservations also there central government allowed reservation this is a government institute central government research reservations also allowed here for the meritorious candidates usually we get students uh, you know uh, uh, meritorious means general category we will get maximum up to the 5000 first 5000 rank 
the lowest tier may be 5000 to 6000 rank only you can see all these figures are there in the iast admission area area in the website you please go and see the website can we work in isro uh, you know you can work I, that's what i said you can work in isro as a permanent employee right now you can work as a private as a business person or a private scientist also you can work now because that opportunities are coming government is going to announce a detailed policy very very soon uh, i get to an opportunity to take part in some of the deliberations and discussion that's why i'm telling so very good opportunities are coming for youngsters you can also be part of such kind of activities as scientists and businessmen that's what i said all kinds of people can be part of such uh, indian space activities right now it is going to be a huge business area you think about anything and anything uh, that you can you can have a solution through space technology and you you can work with this ro scientists also so average economic cost of a space mission that is what another question is asking there are lot there are lot of differences there roughly you know we spend about the 400 400 to 500 crores including satellite and launch vehicles i am not adding the fis, fis, uh, the uh, fixed cost there are a lot of fis, fixed costs also involved like you know salaries and you know uh, what uh, established ex expenditures uh, like you know infrastructure expenditures and all see if you look at the components and if you look at the uh, you know that uh, the the newly formed uh, rocket and the satellites you we spend roughly uh, isro we means isro spend roughly around 400 to 500 crore on an average for a mission but that will go up to 700 to 800 crore like a mission like mars mission and all so that will vary according to the mission and uh, the, you know the complexity of the mission and the type of fuel that uh, you know the mission is using and the type of uh, you know vehicle that you know if you use you know very heavy vehicles which have lot of a uh, lot of you know that uh, thrust which have lot uh, which have lot of capacity of you know that uh, fuel and all you may name you may have to spend a huge amount of money so average mission cost will spend uh, depending upon what mission that you are talking about so uh, whether iast is increasing seats or not iast has already increased seats according to the uh, the reservation policies and uh, we are not in, 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 in increasing the seats right now based on the based on the normal situation but depending upon the government decisions various other decisions whatever actually extra seats like you know recently you know that uh, um, financially accord uh, meritorious students that you know they have some 10 percent reservations if we introduce in iast uh, admission also so such kind of introduction is there such as, other than that we are not expanding any uh, seats for uh, btec students i already answered this question sir how you to join isro through iast uh, that i answered does artificial intelligence have a role definitely that you know that you please i am not quite competent person to answer that but as an economic person i'll tell you artificial intelligence is going to control the world very soon and then it has a bigger role in in space technology also combined effort of the artificial intelligence and space technology going to going to solve lot of problems for the world right now so therefore this technology is having a lot of importance in along with space technology in the in the new new knowledge economy world also any other institute is there similar to iast in india it is not there india it is only one institute in asia also only one institute that will be completely dedicated for space science and technology so no other institute in india which is offering exclusively uh, you know undergraduate program and graduate program related to space science and technology so you can see another university in the world that is caltech you can see one university is there in under esa european space agency there is another one european union there is another agency also there so other than that you won't find many universities in the world also which is exclusive so here it is exclusive for space science and technology that's what the importance we won't concentrate more on other areas we are also see as an economist i am also working related to space science and technology development so that is why we are all here so this is dedicated to that there is no other institute there is no other branch of iast in anywhere in the world or in india yeah what what about cosmology and other research definitely this is our organization isro uh, you know cosmological research you know a, a part we also do in, in department of earth and space sciences they do a uh, part of such kind of uh, you know research also so you can explore you can go to website and see the 
profile of various faculty members and contact them directly through the email so they will be replying to you so this is a wonderful opportunity for you in the country definitely you just uh, they will definitely help you somebody is raising that concern like that so you can you can contact any one of us through email there is a email id there in the website www.iast.ac.in you just go there and go to various departments you can see the faculty profile you go to faculty and you can see the email id and then take the email id and write to them definitely they will reply and then your queries and concerns okay so i think almost hands i think time is up uh, next uh, speaker is waiting waiting i think so thank you so much thank you for this wonderful opportunity uh, and if you have more questions are there you please send it to uh, the organizers and then you can send it to us and then i'll be answering that and sending it to you thank you thank you sir that was too much of information <laughs> thank you one a beautiful thing what i understood was everybody has space in the space yeah, as you said you. i was wondering what is this economist do yeah yeah i can't hear you now again your your voice is breaking the space and it was very all understand that every thing what is this economist doing in the space Yeah, yeah. Um, everybody, everybody, everyone has that doubt. You made it very clear. We have sociologists. We have everybody. literature. We have literature. We have management. Uh, Doctor Shaiju. Yes, sir. I think uh, you can that... continue till the four fifteen, Marina. Why? Why is that? What happened? No, we have one slot. Yes, sir. No, no. That actually uh, next session is ready. I think. Who is taking the next? Who is? Go, go in the good team. Oh, oh, he's there. Okay, okay, no problem. Yeah, okay, 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 okay. Then, then pay. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, students. Acho, I have a another session. I'm going to put ready. Okay. Hello. Okay. Another session. I, sir, ready. I think he will start. Go on, put it. Yeah. Okay. So, let me conclude, students. If India is three trillion dollars economy today, by 2025 we need to make it a five trillion dollars economy. Yes. Yeah. Go ahead. Father. Stop. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
in various areas surveys showing in countries economics growth agricultural department industry business telemedicine disaster management communication in every area so we all have a scope here and i'm asking you you should be the promise of tomorrow we should be aggressive we should not be behind indian should not be behind look at the way sir was telling that unless each one of you focus for that we will not be able to achieve it we should all be very much focused even during this pandemic time look at the way no the space has support, supported us so it's our turn also to be very serious about each one of us we have to use all our resources for our country for the human kind for the for the whole universe so that is my advice to you from the lesson which sir has taught us now now we are waiting for dr govind the uh, shaju sir is an associate professor space and science yeah he is there he is there already he is there gondamundi sir is there okay okay yeah. okay welcome welcome gondamundi so please turn turn on the mic hello maybe from there i think from there you have to give permission from there you have to give permission govinda kuti sir has a interesting biodata students you can hear this he has completed his bsc in physics from there when for machine at more phd in atmospheric science we experienced in the usa worked as a university is mathematical can't hear you modeling of tropical cyclones and extreme weather events you can put it like this and i think it will be all right oh, yeah okay uh now okay. i don't know whether yeah sir could you please uh, put your curtain little this thing light is coming from your back okay. i have interruption but yes uh is the is it's not the mic uh, is the connectivity is a space is the connectivity may i stop bit unmanned aerial way so you can listen to may I start my presentation hello uh, yeah, we, we can, yeah yeah we can hear you please oh. go ahead
Okay, uh, so I, I will be talking about uh, tropical cyclone and climate change today. Uh, this is basically one which you're seeing here is the satellite picture of uh, Hurricane is Isabel, uh, which is formed over Atlantic Ocean in September 2003. So you must be wondering what is a tropical cyclone person or, or an atmospheric scientist is doing in ISRO or space sciences. Space sciences, uh, as in you know, satellite technology and development of satellite technology, is mostly used for understanding uh, uh, the Earth resources and the atmospheric processes. So, uh, one of the major disaster disastrous weather event which we are seeing is uh, which we are seeing very frequently uh, today is uh, tropical cyclones. With the advent of space technologies, uh, which uh, ISRO is also a part of it, we could understand uh, the processes through which a tropical cyclone forms, and and it's and and we we are, we are also in process of studying how uh, climate change is actually influencing uh, the tropical cyclone and its growth. So I'm I'm talking about the science how the climate change is related to the tropical cyclones here. Um, the severity of cyclones has uh, increased uh, in the uh, recent decades. So this has triggered a speculation uh, of uh, the linkage of tropical cyclones to the climate change. So today's talk, we, I will be addressing about the science behind the genesis, growth, and dissipation of tropical cyclones and its linkage to the climate change. So <clears throat> I'll start with some history. So uh, with, with a very debatable statement. So if there were no tropical cyclones, Japan may not have existed in our world map. So you may be wondering what is the relationship between tropical cy cyclone and its existence to the uh, Japan in, its, uh, in the map. So there is a history behind it, a uh, very interesting history. It's, uh, you might have heard of Genghis Khan. He is a very famous uh, uh, emperor of Mongol Empire. Uh, he has a grandson whose name is Kubali Khan. Kubali Khan is the one uh, who has established the Yuan dynasty. Uh, he, Kubali Khan was instrumental in integrating China, northern and southern China, to make it a one single country. So Kubali Khan had a very powerful army So at that point of time, and he wanted to conquer Japan. So he set forward to conquer Japan via sea coast. So once he reached the sea coast um, with his uh, enormous army, what has happened is that uh, at that point of time, uh, Japan has a very you know uh, inferior army as compared to that of the Kubali Khan. So if there uh, if a war would have happened, Kubali Khan has definitely won that war. But what has happened is that when the Kubali Khan's army reached uh, the Japanese coast, he has, he has set his expedition through uh, oceans, and when he has reached the Japanese coast, a very strong tropical cyclone uh, reached that coast and made a landfall on that coast. So this has actually devastated Kubali Khan's army. So his plan was shattered and he has to run back empty handed. Uh, so after several years, uh, he again set forward to conquer Japan. Uh, he has reached this, he, this time also he has reached a Oya Sea coast uh, to attack Japan. So the second time also the events have, have repeated. When he reached the sea coast, what has happened is that there, is, there was another land, uh, another uh, tropical cyclone which is which just made a landfall on the very same day when the Kubali Khan's army reached uh, the Japanese coast, and once again his army was shattered. So he has to run back uh, to his kingdom. So after that, he has never attempted to conquer the Japan. So suppose if there were no tropical cyclone, he might have easily conquered Japan. He might have integrated that with the China. So we may, it is, it is a possibility that we may see Japan and China as one country if uh, today, if there were no tropical cycle. That's the history behind it. So the Japanese uh, uh, believe that this is basically some divine, due to some divine intervention, two times the same thing repeated. And uh, they thought that this is because of some divine intervention and uh, God has actually intervened to help them uh, from uh, Kubali Khan's army. So they started calling this wind as Kamikaze that uh, Japanese word, which means uh, divine wind, the wind that saved the Japan. Okay, So that's uh, that's some history about uh, tropical cyclone. 
So now we uh, will start with uh, the naming uh, conventions. Uh, tropical cyclones are known by different names, um, like hurricanes, uh, uh, tropical cyclones itself, and typhoons, etc. So often people ask, what is the difference between hurricane and tropical cyclone and typhoons? There is no difference between tropical cyclone, typhoons, and hurricanes. The only difference is that they form in different basins. That's, that's the only difference. So hurricanes, tropical cyclones, typhoons, all are exactly the same thing. Uh, uh, and there is no difference between the, uh, this. It is only the name which changes with the different with the, uh, with the respective different basins. So uh, throughout this presentation, I'll keep interchanging the names like hurricanes, tropical cyclones, and typhoons according to my convenience. Do not con get confused. I am referring to the same phenomenon, tropical cyclone. Even when I, I call that a hurricane or tropical cyclone, there is no difference. It's the same event I'm talking about. Uh, let's talk about the origin of the uh, name. Uh, okay. Uh, so hurricane might have originated from uh, the name Huracan. Huracan is, uh, is a name of a Mayanese god. You can see on the bottom, uh, he is a man with uh, uh, no torso and just two hands in it. So it, is, it just resembles uh, the shape of a hurricane. Uh, the symbol of a hurricane. This is the symbol of hurricane. So you can see that there is a, it is a, this the name the the shape of the Mayanese god resembles the shape of uh, uh, hurricanes. Uh, so from there uh, they might have uh, the name might have originated, and Huracan is the name which is given to the hurricane. Then uh, the cyclone. The word cyclone uh, means it is called coil of snake. It is a Greek word. It is uh, coined by Henry Piddington. And uh, uh, cyclone. That that's the word meaning of cyclones. Uh, Sorry, uh, so, something is disturbing me. Like um, it, it keeps asking me, see waiting room and all. Can you just, can you just make me uh, remove me as co-host? Probably that's because it is coming up. It's disturbing my screen. Hello. Uh, hello, Marina. Can you hear me? Uh, sir, I heard you. Yeah. You being the co-host, that's the way you can screen share, and that is permitting you to admit people. Also, let me figure it out from yeah, your yes, end. I don't, I don't want to. I mean, you can admit the people because this I is. I can understand. Yes, sir. In yes, sir. Yes. So I'll continue now for the time. Uh, so then uh, uh, you can see uh, the typhoon, the name typhoons, uh, which is actually originated from. Uh, uh, the name of uh, draconian uh, earth demon again that's from greek you can see on the very right hand side of this this is, this is the shape of a typhoon god and uh, the name might have originated from typhoon uh, the name typhoon might have originated from the typhoon anatomy of tropical cyclone so now we have a lot of satellites to uh, figure out how a, how a tropical cyclone looks like but before 19th century when there were no drop, when there were no satellites, we uh, uh, could actually rarely point how point out how or rarely understand how a cyclone structure will look like. Uh, by looking at the fallen trees, uh, the di direction of the fallen trees, people identified that the direction of this uh, of or the, the the way in which the cyclone having uh, the, the, the way the winds uh, rotate is actually uh, is in a counterclockwise direction in the northern hemisphere and clockwise direction in the southern hemisphere. So they actually look, they actually traveled to different places. They saw how the uh, wind, uh, trees fall, and based on the direction of fall, they've estimated the direction of the wind circulation. So looking at the disruptions at the top of the mountains, they have understood that, okay, the cyclone is not just near the surface, it has also some vertical extension as well. So that's how people uh, before 19th century uh, identified uh, the structure of a tropical cyclone. But uh, by now, we have uh, a lot of satellites which is uh, in this space, which can actually figure out how a cyclone look like. Now we know in and out of a cyclone, the structure of a cyclone and how it looks like. In general, this is how a structure looks like. Um, you have an eye of a cyclone, which is at the center of uh, the cyclone. Then there is an eye wall, which is a vertically, eye wall is nothing but a vertically extending cloud from almost near the surface to almost like 13 to 15 kilometers from the surface of the earth. 
So apart from this, there are you can see there are you know a lot of clouds at different heights. So cyclones are nothing but uh, a, a rotating column of circulation with a lot of clouds with, along with it. So the major components are an eye and an eyeball, and also there is a there is a kind of wind. There are two different components of wind circulation you can see in the bottom figure. So the red arrows, whichever I am pointing here, is basically the spiraling wind. It's basically responsible for rotating the circulation, or the rotation column of the wind. And there is another type of uh, wind component, which is actually moving in a radial direction. Let's imagine a circle. So it is moving in the in direction of its uh, radius. So that uh, radial uh, movement of the wind is called what we call as radial component of the wind. Uh, you can see that the wind actually moves radially inward. Then it, it, it rises up and moves out, moves outward. Whereas another component, which is the spiraling component, which has which helps the cyclone to rotate, which for, which produces the rotation of this uh, cyclone. So this is in general the structure of a tropical cyclone, and uh, within the eye of a cyclone, which which means at the center of the cyclone, there is a descending air. Descending air means air from the top of the atmosphere descends towards the surface near the eye of a tropical cyclone. Now let us look at more closely how does an eye of a tropical cyclone look like. Eye is basically a hole which you might have observed it in, in a tropical cyclone pictures. It is a hole which is at the center of a tropical cyclone. So how do you feel when you are inside the eye of a tropical cyclone? So the figure which is on the right hand side is uh, a photo, sorry, clicked from uh, from within inside a, a hurricane named as Hurricane Dorian. The hurricane has made a landfall uh, in Bahamas Island. And uh, when it, it made a landfall, uh, a, a, some photo is clicked from within the eye of a tropical cyclone. So what you see here is, you can see that in, within the eye of a cyclone, you, you, there is no um, wind, stronger winds. You can see all the trees over here, they are all upright. You know, it is even not swaying in the directions, it is all upright. And you can see uh, the clear sky above, you know, and you can even see the sun on one, one, of, the, one of its corner. So there is no wind at all. So unlike what we imagine that eye of a, eye of a storm is, is the area where it, you're having the strongest wind, um, it is not the case. You are seeing a very calm, light wind, clear skies, and no rain inside the eye of a storm. Okay? It is very calm inside and it is very hot also. Uh, so this is how an eye of a cyclone looked like. I'll just show you in next slide uh, a video. Uh, this is basically an expedition into the eye of a, a, a cyclone, which is a hurricane, which is known as Hurricane Irma. Uh, so scientists usually conduct experiments uh, by going inside the tropical cyclone uh, in flights. They uh, use uh, sensors to collect red and radars to collect observations from within the eye of a storm uh, and from uh, the eyewall of the storm as well. Uh, so this is one such expedition into the eye of a Hurricane Irma. So I'll just show you a video just to give you a feeling how uh, an eye uh, look like when you're inside, uh, how, how, how do you feel when you're inside the eye of a storm? You see, when uh, this is how, the, this is the point at which the cyclone penetrates through the clouds. You can see it is a very turbulent atmosphere outside. And dark clouds. Yes. See, once you reach the eye, there is uh, there are no dark clouds. You can see the uh, blue sky over over you, and you can uh, also see uh, the sunlight. So this is how uh, you feel like when you are inside the eye of a storm. It's very clear and calm inside. Next slide. So this is uh, about the naming of tropical cyclones. So people may wonder, usually wonder, how do we name every every time when a cyclone forms over Bay of Bengal or Arabian Sea? We used to hear some names like Umpun, uh, Nisarga. Where does the name comes from? Is it like random? Some people sitting there somewhere, okay, randomly choose this is going to be the name of the cyclone. Actually, it is not the case. The uh, people who are responsible for naming the cyclone is, uh, is there are six uh, centers uh, around the globe. Uh, one center is located in Delhi, which is called RSMC, Regionally Specialized Meteorological Center. Uh, so they are responsible for giving the names. 
So for India, uh, for uh, Indian Ocean, North Indian Ocean, there are 13 countries, neighboring for, for nearly uh, 13 neighboring countries. India is responsible for issuing tropical cyclone warning. The countries include Bangladesh, India, Iran, Maldives, Myanmar, Oman, Pakistan, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Sri Lanka, Thailand, UAE, Yemen. For all these countries, India is India is responsible for issuing the warning type of tropical cyclone warning. So they collect the name from all these countries, and uh, they uh, RSMC uh, uh, compiles the names, and this name will be sent to WMO. WMO is the UN body, which is a World Meteorological Organization, which who approves the names. So this is the list which is uh, uh, released recently. So the first name is in the list is Nisarga. Now we know that Nisarga is a, a tropical cyclone which is made a landfall over Mumbai coast. So uh, now this will go on in an order, in an alphabetical order. So next is, uh, next cyclone when it forms, it is it will be named as Gati. Okay, that is an Indian name. Uh, then the name comes from uh, Iran, which is called Naivar. Uh, Burevi, etc. So it will go on like this uh, till this list expires. That is how we name this cyclone. So, so the list is already there. So the names will be, will be taken from this list. Uh, impact of tropical cyclone. Tropical cyclone uh, produces a lot of uh, you know destructions. We know that it is it is actually it is responsible for uprooting the trees. It causes uh, issues to the buildings. You know, and billions and billions of losses is uh, accrued every year because of the tropical cyclone. So the question here is that where does this uh, energy of tropical cyclone comes from you know, to produce that much of destructions? So a typical energy of a tropical cyclone is uh, assumed to be uh, uh, using a, using the energy of a tropical cyclone, a typical tropical cyclone, you can power 30 billion 100 watt bulb. So that much of energy is available in a hurricane for a given time. So, so actually tropical cyclone or hurricane is a powerhouse. So where does it, uh, this energy comes from? That is a question. Uh, the answer is the energy comes from oceans. Oceans are the major supplier of energy. And energy is supplied in the form of uh, something which we call as latent heat. So uh, I'll give an example to understand this further. Let's say you uh, are uh, coming out of a swimming pool on a very hot day. So what you will see immediately, what you will feel is, suppose a hot air blows your, over your body. So immediately you will get a cooling sensation. Why do you get a cooling sensation when the water droplets are on, on your body? It's because a part of energy which is instant on your body is used for evaporating the water droplets to water vapor. So that energy, which is, which is, which is, called, which is latent heat or latent, latent means hidden, will be there in the atmosphere. Energy can neither be destroyed nor be created. So energy cannot be destroyed. So that energy will remain in the atmosphere in the form of water, water vapor molecule. So when um, when a proper condition comes in, uh, the uh, water dro water vapor droplets condenses and form water droplets. So that's what we see as clouds. So when it forms water droplets, the energy is released. And this energy uh, is uh, uh, released. And that energy is the source for uh, tropical uh, running the tropical cycle. So, uh, so the energy is supplied by oceans. So that's the reason why uh, when you, you might have heard when the tropical cyclone makes a landfall, uh, immediately it will uh, you know, start decaying or dissipating. That's because it is cut off from, from its energy source, which, is, which are the oceans. So, that's, so from the oceans, it derives the energy in the form of latent heat. So I don't know how, much, how many of you are familiar with Carnot engines and uh, probably the plus two students might have learned so uh, tropical cyclone works in the same way as a uh, Carnot engine or Carnot cycle. Uh, so it is just like your automobile engine. Uh, it has uh, the latent heat is available. So it converts heat energy to mechanical energy. This mechanical energy is, is in the form of wind speed is used for destruction. Okay. All these destructive things of rooting the trees and all these destructions which tropical cyclone produce is in the form of mechanical energy. So there is an energy conversion from a, uh, uh, you know, from a um, heat energy to mechanical energy. The energy is converted through uh, using a Carnot cycle or just like your automobile engine is doing. Automobile, what does automobile engine do? It converts the heat energy which is stored in the fossil fuels or petrol to mechanical energy. So similarly, tropical cyclone also works in the same way. So uh, it basically, uh, you have uh, uh, all the four cycles there uh, like adiabatic compression, isothermal 
uh, expansion, adiabatic expansion, and isothermal compression. It goes through all this. Like, I'm not going into details of this. So the cyclone, in the same way, the tropical cyclone also goes through all these four cycles and uh, converts the um, heat energy, latent heat energy, into mechanical energy, which is used for destructions. So a one-to-one -one comparison of an automobile engine to the hurricane or tropical cyclone. Tropical cyclone converts uh, an automobile engine. Both converts heat energy into mechanical energy. Uh, you know, both the automobile engine and, and the tropical cyclone follows the four uh, steps of a uh, uh, classical Carnot cycle. Uh, whereas automobile engine is an inefficient heat engine, but uh, hurricane is almost like an ideal heat engine, which can convert almost all the heats available uh, into uh, the mechanical energy. And uh, there is a uh, the working substance for an automobile engine is petrol, uh, diesel, etc. Whereas the working substance for a hurricane is moist air, water droplets, and ice crystals. So that's the fuel. The fuel is the water drop, water vapor droplets, or water droplets, or ice crystals, or moist air is actually the uh, fuel uh, for a tropical cyclone. Whereas for uh, for a petrol engine, your car or or uh, your, your bike, you will be using petrol or diesel. So how a cyclone is formed? Uh, that is one question which uh, uh, people generally ask. So imagine there is a region over the uh, ocean, which is actually due to some reasons uh, that one particular region will get heated up. So there is a region which get heated up. So what will happen is that the um, uh, when the ocean get heated up, the air just above uh, it will also get heated up. So when the air becomes warmer, we know that warmer air is less dense. So it naturally naturally rises up. You might have seen the hot balloons, which is having the fire inside, will rise up. That's because it's it has become it is, it is having light, lighter air inside it. So it, move, it moves up. Actually. So when it moves up, what will happen is that there is a low pressure region is created. In, when a low pressure region is created, the air from the uh, surrounding regions rushes into that region. So uh, it is just like opening your cycle valve to you just open it, you will see, you will hear the sound, uh, a hissing sound in which air rushes out. Why? Because your uh, cycle tube or cycle tire has uh, air at a high pressure, whereas, whereas the atmosphere has uh, a low pressure. So air rushes out of it and uh, reaches the atmosphere uh, from a high pressure system to a low pressure region. So that is, that is something which is naturally happens. And the force which is acting here is a pressure gradient force. So you can see that in the bottom figure, there is high pressure region and the wind moves from high pressure region to low pressure region. So, but the question which is not fully answered is that you, you I mentioned that, and we also know that the cyclone is having a rotating column of circulation. It is not like a straight uh, you know, wind which is moving into a low pressure system. What makes it rotating or what makes a rotating column of, uh, or what makes a hurricane or a tropical cyclone spin? For that, uh, I need to explain, uh, uh, okay, this is a low pressure cell. So L is marked as, as a low pressure cell a low pressure region. So now uh, you just imagine that there is a, okay, sorry. so the, so there is a, so wind, uh, there is a high pressure region outside. So the wind will blow from a high pressure region to a low pressure region, just like what you see in this figure. Okay. So the, as I mentioned before, the force which is acting here is the pressure gradient force. So now uh, there is another force, which we are actually forgetting. There is one force, which is called a Coriolis force. And this Coriolis force is due to the rotation of the earth due to the rotation of the earth uh, the uh, uh, there is a, another force which develops which is which is responsible for changing the direction of the wind and this uh, uh, force is what we call as coriolis for the force due to the uh, rotation of the earth and you will see a black line here black line which is the coriolis force and the red line which is the pressure gradient force so two forces act in balance so when two forces act in balance instead of moving uh, the instead of wind moving in straight line it is actually moving in a rotating column. This makes the cyclone rotate. So it is because of the rotation of the earth, you are seeing the, the tropical cyclone spinning. The rotation of the earth produces uh, a force which is called Coriolis force, pressure gradient force and Coriolis force balances. You might have also studied centrifugal force. When it is having a curved path, there are three forces which is acting, pressure gradient force, Coriolis force and centrifugal force, which forms uh, the uh, tropical cyclone. And so remember, the rotation of the earth is responsible for the formation of the to, to make the hurricane spin. And you might have also noticed that the direction, look at the direction of the rotation. It is rotating in a direction which is opposite to the direction of the clock, okay, which is what we call as anti-clockwise. So this direction is anti-clockwise. The wind direction is anti-clockwise in uh, Northern Hemisphere. 
and the wind direction will become clockwise in the southern hemisphere. That's because the sense of rotation or the sense in which the Coriolis force acting in northern hemisphere and southern hemisphere are opposite. In northern hemisphere, it tends to make the direction uh, anti-clockwise. Southern hemisphere, it tends to make the direction of the rotation clockwise. So you you now onwards, if you observe a tropical cyclone over the northern hemisphere and southern hemisphere, you will always observe that. You will also always find that the, the, the sense of rotation will always be anti-clockwise or opposite to the direction of the clock in the northern hemisphere and clockwise in the southern hemisphere. And uh, uh, so Cori Coriolis force is actually zero uh, near the equator. Coriolis force is maximum near the uh, polar region. So uh, near the polar region, it is going to be maximum. That's why you rarely see tropical cyclone forming over polar, uh, tropical region or, or very close to the equator. So we Kerala, which is bounded by uh, oceans throughout, we rarely see tropical cyclone just because uh, just because we are we are very close to the equator. So in the absence of Coriolis force, uh, you uh, will rarely see uh, the tropical cyclones forming. Uh, categories. Uh, so tropical cyclones are categorized into different you know. Uh, Categories and based on the uh, strength of the cyclones, starting from depressions. So new number them the So new number them is basically is, is a uh, is a is also form of cyclone which is having a wind speed of almost like 31 to 50 km per hour. Uh, so then it uh, slowly moves up, and the the largest one is the super cyclonic storm. Normally, uh, our umpun cyclone is actually a super cyclonic storm, which is actually have causing a wind speed of almost like 221 km per hour. So this, this categorization is done by uh, India Meteorological Department. So the, the parameters which is required for uh, the formation of tropical cyclone is uh, warm sea surface temperature. Or sea surface temperature is the ocean to middle uh, temperature. Uh, 26.5 degrees Celsius in the middle of the Because that's one who which is supplying uh, the energy for the tropical cyclone. And the latent heat is, is supplied by oceans. So oceans should be warmer enough to uh, make uh, more, more and more evaporation. Evaporation on the cyclone is sustained. Sea surface temperature 26.5 degrees Celsius and above. That is one condition. Sea surface temperature is The near ocean surface will be uh, moist. In a, uh, no, that is not just the enough uh, thing. You we need to have a mid-level moisture. Atmosphere in the third level moisture 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 You will have to uh, have a mid-level moisture. That means uh, three to five kilometer uh, levels should also be moist with uh, sh should have uh, enough moisture for the formation of tropical cycle. In a, uh, Coriolis force, as I mentioned before, Coriolis, Coriolis force is one important thing which is formation of which is for, which is responsible for the formation of tropical cyclone. Then there is something which we call as weak vertical wind shear. Weak vertical wind shear and the So let's say this figure. Uh, so you can see that the wind speed actually is actually changing with respect to the height. So near surface, uh, the wind speed is less, and it, as it moves on, the wind speed increases. So this change in the wind speed with respect to the height is what we call as wind shear. So just uh, imagine this like a top, uh, which is how it's spinning in its own, in its own axis. So when uh, uh, you, as long as you do not disturb, it will just rotate. Now, if you make, if you give it some external force, what will happen is that this top will uh, topple uh, and it will fall down. So just like this, tropical cyclone is also like a rotating spin, uh, rotating uh, top uh, and with, with its own axis. Vertical wind shear is providing an external force, which makes the cyclone uh, tilt. Once it tilted, then it cannot sustain. So that's why we always, uh, it is uh, the weak vertical wind shear is one important component for the formation of a tropical cyclone. Then even if all these conditions are there, there should be a trigger for the formation of tropical cyclone. Trigger on the it's just like uh, a spark plug in your automobile engine. So even if you have a fuel in automobile engine, you need a spark to burn the engine uh, or to burn, uh, to start the process. So just like this, for the formation of tropical cyclone, there, is, there needs to be a trigger uh, even if all the conditions are present. Okay. Now uh, I will just tell you, I will just try to connect how the tropical cyclones are related to the climate change or global warming. Global warming in because I, uh, by this time, I think you might have, you might know what is what a global warming is. That is much discussed topic in these days. Um, so global warming is nothing but in the enhanced greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, uh, increases the uh, warmth or temperature of the globe. 
and this and uh, the question is uh, how does this actually uh, affects uh, the tropical cyclone activity so uh, one possible way is that global warming as, as it warms up the globe it increases the sea surface temperature uh, i just mentioned before that sea surface temperature or the temperature near the ocean surface is very important for the formation of tropical cyclone so uh, more warming produces more warmer sea surface temperature so increased sea surface temperature increases the evaporation from the ocean when more and more evaporation happens more and more water molecules will get converted into water vapor molecules uh, water vapor molecules act as a fuel for storm so when more moisture is available in the atmosphere there is a possibility for uh, generation of more intense or high intense storms um uh, just i'll just tell you a story of hurricane harvey this is again a tropical cyclone which is formed over atlantic ocean uh this has produced unprecedented rainfall in uh, the uh, united states uh, you can see the uh, photos of this rainfall uh, and flooding which is caused by hurricane harvey so why is it, why did i choose this cyclone for discussion is that this is the uh, uh, hostless cyclone which amounts to almost which has produced a destruction of almost like 125 billion in the us history it is one of the wettest cyclone in the history of us so uh, the the reason for choosing this hurricane harvey is that it has has some signals of climate change and there are signals in northern yeah it stalled out in one area for a given uh, for a uh, for a larger period of time northern cyclones are usually moving it is it, it has its uh, wind wind circulation in along it but sure when a cyclone is forming on bay of bengal or arabian sea you might have seen that it is actually moving from uh, bay of bengal and arabian sea and making landfall over uh, ocean the nammada orissa lo orissa coast lo andhra pradesh lo bangladesh lo evdengil vannathu like makes a landfall so cyclone also moves uh, in its own uh, you know it has its own velocity other uh, is so but if the, the cyclone has uh, stalled other uh, move yada or stalathu enna kore nerundamo a particular cyclone uh so it has dumped records of rainfall for uh, several days angana ninnittu it it has actually produced a lot of rainfall over uh, for several days and it has produced a rapid intensification ee moonu aanu climate inde signals aayittu nammal parayunnu so now i will explain you one by one how does this uh, uh, reveals us the signals of climate uh so it has been established that climate scientists um, established that uh climate change causes slow down of global circulation global circulation nu arnjaynale i'm not, not talking about the circulation within the uh, tropical cyclone the wind wind which is actually extending or 20000 kilometers ak extend cheyna larger wind circulation aanu namu global circulation nu parayam so uh, so hurricanes are just like carried by large scale wind or example parayam or analogy parnjaynale you just assume that a ball is floating on a uh, stream of water so when the stream of water is moving uh, in a in fast then the ball will also move fast when the stream of uh, stream moving slowly then the ball will also move slowly so uh, the speed of the ball depends upon uh, this the velocity of the stream so global circulation is so you can imagine that this ball is a hurricane and the stream of wind is the global circulation so uh, when due to climate change the global circulation slows down so when it slows down the movement of the cyclone is also slows down just like the ball which is uh, moving when the stream is moving slowly the ball will also move slowly ball is a hurricane here so uh, so climate change you wonder we are expecting that the cyclones will move slowly and that is seen in hurricane harvey adutha randavada njan parnadu so it has produced unprecedented rainfall and all so uh, i'll just explain you uh, i don't know this it is a very so first you get ready for you let's uh, so just assume that there is a um, uh, there is a, a, a tank which is having some water in it um, so there is air above it so when you heat it from the bottom what will happen is that there is a, a evaporation will happen and uh, the air will have more water vapor molecules so after a certain time there is uh, the there will be a evaporation rate that means the rate at which the water molecules will get converted to water vapor so other words are that there is also another process which is happening the water vapor water vapor molecule will get converted to water also this is what we call as condensation rate so when the evaporation rate become condensation rate we call that as saturation so uh, when uh, the condensation rate increases beyond evaporation rate we call that as super saturation so clouds are going to have a super saturated condition so when the air becomes warmer what will happen is that the condensation rate will go down this is just like heating the uh, the chamber from top 
so when warm when uh, when the air becomes warmer the condensation rate will reduces and evaporation rate will increase so what will happen is that there will be more water vapor molecules available in the atmosphere so warmer air can hold more water vapor okay so if the air is warmer it can hold more water vapor so global warming kond uh, surface mathravalla atmosphere um chooda avum when atmosphere uh, when atmosphere gets heated up it can hold more water vapor than before so when condition comes in then when clouds form it will be it will have lot of moisture in it okay so so when there is lot of moisture then the rainfall will be very huge unlike before so global warming kondu undavuna oru problem nu parayunnal atmosphere inde choodu koodumbo adinath oru vaadu water vapor molecule undavu sadharana sadharana ullad enakka then what will happen is that uh, so oru vaadu water vapor molecule undavu clouds undavunnathu valla thundra saathla clouds um rainfall undavu so namukku sadharana undavuna rainfall nekkal kudal shaktamaayittulla rainfalls oru global warming scenario undavu so in a hurricane's case so due to the warmer air uh, in a global warming situation the temperature is is actually higher it can hold more water vapor and this is basically produces very uh, large uh, very strong precipitation as angane oru idu nammal hurricane harvey il kandu very strong precipitation is is which is actually unexpected precipitation all over kandu adoru climate climate change inde oru signal aayittana parayunnu so another thing is that the rapid intensification other that the cyclone the velocity if it is increasing um, by almost like 55 km per hour uh, km per hour nokka parayunnal namukku imagine cheyavundhe ullu because in is like nammada uh, oru car or typical speed nu vana 40 km per hour to 60 km per hour so 55 km per hour oru divasathile increase speed wind speed koodunnundengile nammala cyclone we will call that as rapidly intensifying cyclone ingena the events the the uh, are very rare in, in the past decades so ipo ee valare adutha kaalathayittu rapid intensification valare koodi varunu rapid intensification of tropical cyclone so it this is a possible reason for uh, uh, this is this is due to the global warming situation so global warming can actually increase the rapid intensification of the tropical cyclone uh, so i'll just skip this this is basically uh, it's not important so in this uh, tropical cyclone nammal uh, arabian sea case we have seen uh, the strongest tropical cyclone gunu last year uh, uh, last the decade uh, one tropical cyclone per year aanu namukku arabian sea kitti kondirunna but in 2019 uh, five tropical cyclone has been developed and uh, it, the year from we have seen twin uh, low pressure systems so this is basically an indication that the climate is changing now uh, this is a, this is basically a, a, a interesting uh, result which is shown by one of my friend they are saying that there is a relation between umpun cyclone and uh, covid covid lockdown so 2019 to 2020 lola rendu figures are kanjirikkan so in which uh, you can see that the pollution the amount of pollution is very high in 2019 2020 apple was the correct so he says that the uh, intensification of tropical cyclone uh, of umpun cyclone is mostly due to the covid lockdown because Uh, there is less pollution less pollution kondu endu sambhavikkunnu nu parayunnal sun's radiation basically reaches the earth surface directly so uh, when there are a lot of dust particles it will get reflected or scattered so when there is le- less amount of dust particles a lot of radiation reaches the ocean surface so ocean surface will get heated up so this is basically producing very high sea surface temperature and this is the reason for uh, the rapid intensification of umpun cyclone nanna parayapadu so it is it has some connection with the covid lockdown so what do we expect in the future we can expect that uh, either there will be uh, same or uh, either decrease in the number of tropical storms so nammala pradeshikkunna pole number of tropical cyclones kooduvalla adu onnigil same aayirikkum allengil korayum but uh, we when when a cyclone forms you will you are going to see more intense and frequent uh, frequent intense storms so intensity of the storms will be very strong and it is having higher rainfall rates Uh, so the speed of the speed of movement of the cyclone will get reduced adayad bay of bengal in oru cyclone undai kanyanal orissa il ethan illengil andhra il ethan ulla samayam koodum in a global warming situation so that is something which uh, finding which shows results so um, uh, okay so ancient mayans believed that we, we we are not sure whether this all these changes which is happening is due to uh, human contribution or it is natural naturally occurring phenomenon so Uh, ancient minds believed that uh, the storms are sent by god to punish them uh, but now also we have the, th- the things have, uh, has not changed i would rather say the storms are uh, on medium in which na- nature mother mother nature conveys uh, things we are actually polluting our nature and uh, um, and 
by sending out a lot of fossil fuels, carbon dioxide again, you know, non-renewable energy resources, you know, and we are polluting the atmosphere. So it is actually a, 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 an after effect of this is actually a, is, is seen in the form or manifested in the form of storms and all this. So actually nature is actually punishing us for our, uh, for our indecent behavior with the nature. So with this, I will uh, conclude my talk. Uh, thank you. If you have questions, you can ask me. Okay, thank you, sir. Hello, Gondamuti. Ah, sir. I think uh, you can also uh, answer, uh, give answer to some of the questions. Okay. Uh... So there is a question about the geomagnetic storm. Uh, okay, I don't know why. Okay, I'll just go through it. One is. Uh, can we predict uh, a cyclone? Yes, we can predict it. Now it is uh, the, uh, you may have also seen the prediction of track prediction of Nisarga, the cyclones and all those things have you know, it's become very accurate. Uh, uh, so can, are tornadoes uh, similar forms of cyclones? Uh, tornadoes are, are, are different. Tropical cyclones are different. Tornadoes uh, forms uh, over the land surface. Tropical cyclone forms over ocean. The scale of a tropical cyclone is about 2,000 kilometers. Tornadoes are some two kilometers or so. Uh, can we reduce the energy of the cyclone? Um, it is not in the hand of human beings. We cannot. The scale is very high, so we cannot uh, do anything with uh, by reducing the. Uh, yes. Then, uh, sir, is there any technology available for? It's, it's, it's moving fast. I can't read. Can we harness energy from tropical cyclone? As of now, there are no technologies because uh, tropical cyclones are very infrequent. It is not uh, occurring every you know time at, at a given point of time. So you cannot just uh, in, install a very expensive system to harness energy from a tropical cyclone. As of now, to my understanding, there is no harnesses uh, of uh, harnessing of energy happens from tropical cyclone. Latent heat can be used for human need. Uh, Latent heat, uh, yeah, basically the energy from the, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, oceans can can be used. Uh, it can be harnessed, uh, but uh, but for that to make, to get the latent heat out of it, you require a lot of energy, which is coming, uh, which is need, which needs to be used to convert the water, water, water molecules into water vapor molecules. So that is actually going to be very difficult. Can, we create energy by cyclone that is uh, about I, I think i've already explained it harnessing the energy of a tropical cyclone it is actually as of now it is uh, uh, to my understanding it is not possible when the pollution is high okay i think magnetic force uh, in the earth can cause tropical cyclone no uh, magnetic force has no relation with the formation of tropical cyclone. So you are, you are talking about something else which is called uh, geomagnetic storms, uh, but that has no direct relationship with the uh, relationship with the formation of tropical cyclone. This is tropical cyclones are forming in very close to the surface and it has nothing to do with um, this uh, the cyclones which is forming, uh, something which is forming much above the atmosphere, uh, much above uh, the uh, troposphere. So, so a tropical cyclone is restricted to some 12 kilometer height. So geomagnetic storm is happening somewhere in 100 to 200 kilometers away from the atmosphere. Can volcanoes of island? Okay. Why is uh, inside the eye is hotter than the surroundings? Why is uh, eye is hotter uh, hotter than the surroundings? That's because there is, a, as I mentioned in one of the slides, that there is a, uh, there is a um, there is a descending circulation in the. That means the air from the top of the atmosphere uh, returns back to the atmosphere. So what, what is happening is that at the upper levels of the atmosphere, there is low pressure and lower level of atmosphere, there is high pressure. So when an air, just imagine that this is a balloon, when it, it comes down, it will get compressed and it, once it gets compressed, it will get heated up. So there is, because of this, 
the inside the eye you will see a uh, increased heat can you explain the cyclone prediction system in india okay cyclone predictions are done mostly using uh, the satellites which is sent by isro plus uh, some numerical models we have uh, we uh, we have the mathematical equations derived for the uh, atmosphere so which is used for prediction of uh, uh, the cyclones so we use the in input information from the satellites which is taken from isro and other uh, many, many other satellites uh, throughout the globe from nasa and uh, jaxa and all those uh, satellites we collect the observations and those observations are used for uh, is assimilated with the uh, numerical weather models to give the forecast so basically it is done with the numerical uh, models with the help of satellite technology um can engine can we stop cyclone uh, so actually uh, as of now uh, it is very difficult if it could have been done it uh, people might have done it much before because uh, it, it it every year it produces losses in in uh, of the order of billions so it's actually very difficult to stop cyclone for the with the current technology so maybe in future if something comes up then it would be good can cyclones be triggered by earthquake to my understanding it it cannot be because uh, tropical cyclone uh, is a, a phenomenon which is happening at a time scale of some uh, say uh, 24 to say uh, 48 hour time scales so this cannot be triggered by something which is called as earthquake so which is uh, tropical cyclone is directly linked to the solar forcing from the sun so i don't think it is directly related to earthquake can we generate artificial cyclone i don't know why we want to generate artificial cyclone the natural cyclone itself is producing a lot of destructions how is chaos theory employed in the form okay that's a very good question chaos theory okay uh, so um, I, i mentioned that the prediction of tropical cyclone is done using uh, numerical models so atmosphere uh, has is 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 a chaotic uh, every weather phenomenon is chaotic so we we are actually using the chaotic theory to uh, and we 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 found, we see that the initial conditions of the model is very sensitive so we uh, use that's where we use satellite observation we use the satellite observations to improve the initial conditions uh, to improve the forecast of the tropical cyclone can we use cyclones for generating energy uh, as of now there is uh, uh, nothing uh, which uh, there is no uh, energy harnessing which is done using tropical cyclone I think that is done. Yes. <clears throat> Maybe. Thank you very much, Govindan Kuti sir. You are indeed a great teacher for small students. You started with the historical story of Japan and how Japan was rescued from China's invasion and all, which made it very interesting, eager for the children. to listen to you on the third hour of this continuous lecture which they may not be that used to and that too in this virtual platform actually a lots of hands on experience they were having from yesterday and today a lot of atmospheric science you taught them in a very uh, understanding manner thank you very much sir and finally about that umphoon cycle 2019 and its connection with covid love, uh, lockdown That, that till there so how you brought it amazing sir your uh, training skills teaching skills uh, thank you very much for joining us today and let me take this opportunity to thank all the three speakers of the day for finding time for our next generation children it's your duty now to follow their path the way they had been showing us nothing is impossible when you are involved with it that is what abdul kalam ji has taught us so get involved in whatever you do understand whatever you learn and uh, use it for the benefit of the world for the benefit of india jai hind good night good day bye okay thank you so much and uh, tomorrow we will uh, have the session 
uh, starting at 1:30 exactly. Thank you, Dr. Gowdanguti, Dr. Shaijumon, and uh, Marina, all uh, students for the patient listening and. Uh, Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, team. Thank you, Sarga Shetra team. Thank you. Thank you, IST team.